just uh, okay. Uh, uh, look at who he kept in his cabinet, including Kigupta, etc. And despite promising in Sona a more efficient, i.e., smaller cabinet, it's as bloated as ever. Then there's his support for expropriation without compensation. Don't buy into his their shuck. It's nothing to be concerned about. It's everything to be worried about. This adoration, the intelligence I have had for Ramaphosa for Osef, forever is passé. He's just another agency politician saying cover versions of the songs that were popular in the House on Socialist era, while today the rest of the world has moved on to popular R and R boogie. When he was elected, Zuma was the great, de great deliverer. Look how that turned out. I agree with your to-do list. That's another point. They're your list, but not necessarily the NC government's or Ramaphosa's. These points and others have been on every rational person's mind, including IMFs and rating agencies for over 20 years. All of us, apparently, except, except apparently them, know what must be done. But the ANC are still, still enthralled by the wonders of scientific socialism. A couple of points about your list. Skills. You mentioned the low numbers of graduates must be reversed. But how? The universities presently accommodate twice as many students, about half unqualified to be there, that they were designed for, which is at the root of the problems, particularly funding, they face. This is what concerns me about many analysts and politicians. They make suggestions that have little relation to reality or don't say how it's to be achieved. A point about skills which we may disagree about is for the size of the economy, which will remain so for the foreseeable future. There is no skills shortage. I've argued this at various times. <laughs> South Africa has a skills mismatch, which is defined as too many or too few skills needed at a specific point, which you allude to. You say WEF downgraded South Africa for low numbers of graduates. I believe you, but human research and capital, which include tertiary education and enrollment, is only one of the seven pillars of global innovation. SA is performing at the level of development and lagging behind less resourced African countries like Rwanda and Kenya. No tell me Ramaphosa cannot act quickly now across the board, your list in other areas, because he, of deals he made and the close calls his election was. He is president and no one is about to recall him. Look how Zuma, with half the NC and the whole country sniping at him, ruled by edict making unilateral decisions for university education was perhaps the le least of the many disastrous ones. The party and the country had to try and clean up after. The entire spectrum of South Africa's social economic policy making and implementation urgent needs urgent overhauling and development, but it's unlikely to happen in our lifetime given that the ANC government believes in tinkering with what works and reverting to obsolete, ideologically pure models and modes of thinking. Okay. Yes, and they just agree. Okay. This is not bad. Um, so, yeah, basically, Ramaphosa. So, basically, uh, Zuma's policies were sort of more pro poor person, poor worker, but perhaps at the expense of actual, like, economic growth and like solvency and that kind of thing and like long-term yeah long-term macroeconomic stability um so they're they're basically arguments both for and uh, against both sides i think and well in any case zuma isn't in incarcerated for his policies right it's for corruption charges so like in any case it doesn't really make sense to to be upset about his uh you know the, the investigation to corruption um because that that's a separate issue. Um, but I don't really know if there's any particular policy here to to there's not there's not much, no. There's not much. I, I'd like to see like specific policies. Um but uh of the economist. South Africa's an, an accountable ruling party. Okay. <laughs> South Africa's an accountable ruling party. Okay, this is this is recent. The ANC descends into unifying again as it tries to suspend top official facing corruption charges. Uh oh crap, I don't have access to the economist. Maybe I should. Oh wait, this is foreignpolicy.com. But it seems to be linked to the economist. Okay. Okay, never mind. Uh Vosa. Economic policies. <laughs> Okay, but this is the government thing. So again, that was the previous thing we saw. It's government propaganda for Zuma. Yeah. Address by President Cyril Ramaphosa to the joint sitting of Parliament on South Africa's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Uh, okay. 
Okay, so he's just okay. So this is just address. Okay, you're talking about COVID nineteen. Okay, blah blah. But I'm sort of less interested actually about the response to COVID and more interested in just the long term, the long term policies. Again, COVID is you know it's a temporary measure. Um, yeah. Okay, to create jobs, a hundred billion R, whatever that is, it amounts to, uh, for for jobs, jobs program. Um, scanning video of this, and you decide how it sounds. Okay, sure. HTTPS colon slash slash you do dot be slash ADV and job DJGC. Hello everyone, welcome to the morning shock, your daily job of news analysis. No drop today, no advert, let's go straight into the news, finding out what the hell is happening in South Africa today. No doubt you have seen all the videos, all the looting, all the vigilante justice, all the violence. This is what South Africa is in the year 2021. And Thanks for like. not be surprised in the slightest. Nothing. If you are surprised, you only Oh uh, yeah, he's saying he'd like to be able to, to, to produce instead of importing. And then I will show you what people have done to protect themselves from this violence. First and foremost, it's the economy, stupid. We've had over 12 years of terrible, ex Oops. the worst educated system in the world, high unemployment. What do you think is going to happen? People out there are desperate. And that desperation manifests in violence. It manifests in looting. It manifests in all sorts of nefarious ways that the state cannot possibly control. This is a real powder keg of <laughs> South Africa. What we're seeing now is just a flare-up. But the real powder keg is people who have absolutely no hope whatsoever. And this is not me defending the protest. I'm not defending the rioting. No, that shit. And if you don't understand what's happening, you're not paying attention. One of the reasons, a major reason why it's happening is because people just have no more hope anymore. This is not a protest about getting Jacob Zuma back in the office of the presidency. This is a okay. protest of people who have nothing to lose. And the second big factor why the Okay, so ending curves, my friend, these women violence AZN, gender inequality. Ateng, home of the two largest Zulu ethnic groups in this entire country. And the Zulus are screwed politically for a number of reasons. Number one, Anglican support in KZN is down. It was at fifty four percent in the last election. No doubt it'll be below fifty percent in the next election. And that leaves a hell of a lot of votes up for grabs for whatever political party is able to stabilize that region. A huge factor in this is just the sheer tribalism, right? The Zulus are nowhere politically. The ANC is letting them go. There is no Zulu in the top six of the ANC for the first time in many a year. And their figurehead, Jacob Zuma, is now in prison. Yeah. Say, and that's where much of the writing was in KwaZulu Natal, which is where Zulus are from. And the way you respond to mobilization is you make something completely ungovernable. And that is exactly what they are trying to do in KZN. There aren't any Zulus in the Northern Cape. That's why there are no protests in the Northern Cape. It is very simple to understand. Again, I'm not defending the people. I'm not defending the rioting. But you have to understand what is going on. And if you take those two flashpoints, the massive economic underperformance of South Africa and people who have nothing left to lose, along with this great ethnic anxiety, you get a flashpoint. And that flashpoint is exactly what we are seeing in South Africa today. But thankfully, these rogue elements are not getting away with it. Yesterday, I spoke to a member of SAPS in KZN. I will link that below. It has been on my channel for the past 12 hours. But if you missed it, I'll link it below. You can find out exactly what is going on on the ground in KZN through the eyes of a member of SAPS. But most importantly and more fundamentally, the neighborhood watchers are coming out in force and they are defending their own community from these predators. <sighs> The following clips may be disturbing to some viewers. No doubt this video will be demonetized, but I do not too care. I think it's important for you to understand what is going on on the ground. So we'll start off with this clip based in Berlin, which is to the north of Durban. Shit. 
And this is exactly what I have been talking about for the past few years. If you want to survive in South Africa, in a fairly free society, you have to build up your community. Only communities can really defend themselves against this sort of predation. Another great example of this is found in the south of KZN near Amantum Coast. What the? Don't waste your ammo. Don't Wait, what? Who? What is? Who is who? Okay, let's go. I'm trying to understand what this is about. What what are they throwing? I don't understand who is who and who like what No clue. It doesn't really even seem like they're shooting. Like and they're just a bunch of people. No time to play here. It's not like real gun it seems like it's not real guns. Do what we have to do. Once again you see community members defending themselves against potential looters. And finally, for the third clip, we go to Port Shepton, where you can see local community members once again, along with Zach, defending their community. The strike is strike in South Africa, Port Shepton. Strike is like people they're coming to burn our businesses. They're coming to. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I get it. So we're, we're looking at it from the perspective of these. From the perspective of these people defending themselves from looting. And notice something in all of those three clips. Well, except the first one, that is. The community and the South African police service are working in tandem. And I think that is such an important issue that we haven't really hmm. spoken about in this country, where the local communities support the local SAPS. And in this case, vice versa, SAPS has actually asked people to come forward, who are asked, to help them quell the riots. Another thing you'll notice in all those clips is that minorities are actually being targeted. And this is, I'm afraid, not really a surprise. Because unfortunately, in times of great despair and upheaval, the minorities are targeted first. So where to from here? It's interesting to see what the reactions have been from different political parties, notably from the EFF. Because as soon as the president announced that the South African National Defense Force would be deployed into the streets of Gauteng and KZN to restore order, Julius Malema tweeted this, No soldiers on our streets, otherwise we are joining. All fighters must be ready, they won't kill us all. We need a political solution for a political problem, not soldiers. And this should hardly be a surprise to anyone, because Malema is a revolutionary, and he's hedging his bets on the fact that the Zulu people of Kaysen will back to them with factional backing. As soon as Malema says law and order, he is completely dead in the water, so he will support any form of aggression against ANC or against the state. We'll see what the EFF does going forward, but if the EFF joins the fray, I don't see any peaceful resolution. So, in conclusion, mm. and a few final thoughts, here's a few things you need to sort of think about. Number one, I don't think the state will be overthrown through this. I don't think it is the Arab Spring that we want. However, the flare-up will continue for a very, very long 
time, public violence in South Africa is a national pastime. Where this play out is quite pernicious and quite obvious, this sort of stuff has been happening around the country for over a decade. Number two, this sort of flare up will continue as long as A, the economy remains shitter, and two, the Zulus have no political power whatsoever. And number three, if it is not so obvious, get a fucking gun. Defend your neighborhood. Build a community. How many times must I explain this to people? However, one good thing to come out of all this, and I'm sorry to use the word good thing, uh, the new bill to ban handguns, I think, is completely and utterly off the table. But, however, if Vicky Teller tries to carry on with his bullshit and his banning of guns, come get us in the cold damn hands, motherfucker. But anyway, that is the show for now. If you are safe, I hope you find a bloody safe beach every now and then. If you did, and most importantly, keep safe, people. Build your communities. Defend yourselves. The police are unable to help you despite their best intentions. The I'm unbanned, bitch. Deployed, but you can really trust them. They don't peace to be forced. Uh -huh. They might Good. escalate tensions. Welcome we'll come back. Escalate them. So for now, all you can rely on is yourself, your family, and your community. If you don't have any of those things, I would just rape The gays could anyway, not cancel me permanently, LUL. Yeah. Well, this looks like this sort of right wing position or something, but I, it's hard. It's hard to really figure. I don't know. But this is generally the problem: is that left wing policies they aim to help the poor, but they also hurt business. And so, in the long term, like you're actually, you know, long term, often what happens is that people end up being worse off, but not necessarily. It's not necessarily always true. And there's always like supposedly there's stuff that happens, but like look. Yeah, so okay, so here, GP per capita and current prices from eighty six to twenty twenty six. So, so here's nineteen eighty four, uh, nineteen ninety four. So it was going up, then it kind of went down, but then suddenly I don't know what happened in two thousand and two. Suddenly there's this huge growth up to two thousand eleven, and then it is it, okay. So the past ten years it's gone back down. Um, so this this is apparently, uh, and this is percent of world average. Finland. Our government is very left leaning. Yeah, but I mean Finland's doing all right, but it's maybe not it's not necessarily the same kind of left. Um and this is the problem with all these things, you know, like the problem is that leftist governments often they aren't great for the economy, but they aren't necessarily as bad as they get I'm painted either. Free health care and education. Yeah, well that you need. I mean that I mean that's the kind of thing that to me that's just essential. I mean, you need, I think you should absolutely have free health care, uh, free education, but for not necess not tertiary education, actually, but up to, you know, for kids, free education for kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need like infrastructure building, um, you know, that uh, police, you know, I, I think everybody agrees on, on the latter. Uh, I also support like research, you know, you need, I don't know, like garbage collection, that kind of thing. Uh, so you see that compared to the world average, it's gone down progressively um, over time, which doesn't mean that in absolute numbers has gone down. Botswana has gone up. Need free housing for the homeless. But of course, this GDP One capita. State for persons. <laughs> I knew that was you, Boston. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you could just give a basic income, like I said, and then you wouldn't have homeless people except for addicted people who then would you know you need just specific programs for them to to be able to you know you, you just deal with them but apart from addicted people then you wouldn't have any any issue uh, with homelessness here again okay here's gdp per capita as we can see it basically had gone down actually here it looks like it went up uh and then it stagnated so it went up there then it stagnated then it went back down and then so apparently, what, what did apartheid stop? Marijuana, so I'll qualify LUL. <laughs> Reefer madness. Yeah. Yeah, the, this is sort of the problem. But the point is, yeah, then if you buy, if you buy all your drugs, um, if you buy all your drugs, then you're homeless, and then what do you do? So yeah, then then you qualify. So what you have to do is ensure that the the housing is shitty so that nobody on purpose just sort of claims to be like intentionally ends up ends up sort of consuming drugs so they can get free housing. So you need to give them like really shitty housing. Why buy something that comes out the ground? 
Well, if it's out of the ground, yeah, but if you if it's illegal, then you still you still can't have it. So then, then there there's that. And then and if and if you're not paying for it, then you're not losing money, which means that you don't need as housing. As growing salary. Yeah, but the point is that then, then okay, so you're doing it sort of in, in hidden. Uh, but then that means that you need a housing, right? You, if you're homeless, you can't do it. So if you're okay, so if you got your own housing, then you can do it, sure. And in any case, if you, then you won't be paying for it, which means that you will have the money to have your own place. Um, okay, the idea of a middle income trap is now over a decade old and continues to be applied to growth paths which have not been self-sustaining. With the bulk of emerging markets now approaching middle you income status. Home to grow outdoors. Well, kind of, because then it gets seen, and if it's illegal, then it gets destroyed. And given the reality of slower growth from many countries, shack. yeah, but where? Like, then there's going to be, like, an illegal building. People are going to, like, inspect it, you know? And the policy recommendations that currently list exist for overcoming this problem. Um, is the middle-income trap still a relevant framework? Using reference to the BRICS countries, the key finding of this analysis is that the middle-income trap conceptualization is of little value added as fundamentals still matter, especially in relation to macroeconomic stability. By the river to irrigate water to plants. Yeah, but then, you know, people, there's like, you know, officials, government officials that will sometimes go there and they'll like see that you've got like some pot behind the rip by the river. And they'll get rid of it. Similar note that quantity, quality institutions are necessary, both political and economic, including smaller size of government and property rights. The trap is currently formulated as thus nothing. Don't know shit brought. As it repackages some family or structural issues while avoiding other crucial ones. Um. Okay. Yeah. So say there's been plateaus. I don't know if you can read this. Can can you read? Can you read what I'm reading? Here, world GDP per capita in constant uh, dollars. See, has just been increasing linearly. This is pretty cool. And like Latin America hasn't grown. Wheat is from the earth. I think. Oh yeah, it has that. Apple is not. But Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa really hasn't grown. Um, East Asian Pacific. Note how East Asian Pacific has grown well, and it was just above Sub-Saharan Africa, and now it's overtaken uh, Middle East and North Africa, and and even Latin America and Caribbean. Um, Yeah, the start-stop growth has been the real story in economic development over the past two decades. Researchers for the World Bank have done this problem of fading growth for middle-income countries. Included tomatoes. Yeah, and including rice. The evil rice that makes everybody go nuts. Rice or madness. Illegal rice. <laughs> Then you have rice dealers. The middle income trap here after MIT has been defined precisely as a slowdown in growth which occur once countries reach middle income levels. In the words of the World Bank, after exceeding the poverty trap... Uh-oh. Wait. Am I recording this? Okay, this is interesting. After exceeding the poverty trap of US dollars, 1,000 GDP per capita... Many emerging market countries head rapidly to the takeoff stage of U.S. 3,000 per capita. Wait. Okay, so there's a 1,000 GDP per capita. Okay. This is first. This is the first poverty trap. Okay, many emerging market countries countries head rapidly to the takeoff stage of U.S. 3,000 per capita. But as they near this figure. They experience long-term economic stagnation, divisions between rich and poor become serious, corruption is rampant, and they fall into the trap. This convention has been picked up by others to utilize boundaries of the trap. As long as a country stays in the middle-income categories, category all the way from a GNI per capita of 1,000 to 12,000, it is presumed to have reached middle income, and it is only when a country exceeds this threshold and becomes high income that is considered to have escaped the middle-income trap. 
Okay. Well, with my thing, I would literally have uh, a GDP per capita that would exceed this with my program of global basic income. So all countries would have escaped this trap. The MIT literature, with the benefit of slightly over 10 years of work, has made happy reference to Latin America's experience in the 1980s and the bulk of empirical observations, but the recent work has focused on the specific problem of growth slowdowns from formerly high-performing countries such as Baltic states or the role of middle class or technology in escaping it. Indeed, the MIT is perhaps more interesting because so few countries have escaped it. Of 101 middle-income economies in 1960, only 13 became high-income by 2008. Equatorial Guinea. Okay, that's such a joke, Equatorial Guinea. Like, it's not a high income. Like, literally, there's just a few rich people who get all the money and everybody else is still poor. Then Greece, Hong Kong, SAR, Ireland, Israel, Japan, Mauritius, Portugal, Puerto Rico, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Spain, and Taiwan. But it's ridiculous that they put Equatorial Guinea. So that's just... <laughs> the vast experience is like Botswana also. Like, they say it's like, now it's a rich country, but like, <laughs> no. The vast experience outside of the select group was a stagnation. Flat America, for instance, seeing income per capita relative to the United States falling almost continuously from 1960 to 2005, especially after the debt crises of the early 1980s. According to Jill and Karas, the economist credited with coining the phrase middle income trap, the only part of the world that has most notably defied this tendency is East Asia. The policy prescriptions and why? Why is East Asia doing so well? The policy prescriptions offered in support of breaking out of the trap have also varied according to the region and or the institution during the examination. Although much research has tended towards recommending strategic, proactive, and career government policies for the advancement of social and firm level capa capabilities. This has been echoed by research from the World Bank that attempts to identify a framework that can guide policymakers on how to identify new industries consistent with the country's latest compar latent comparative advantage. This research also notes that government must play an active role in facilitating industrial upgrading and infrastructure improvements. In relation to the BRICS countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the middle income trap and its policy prescriptions have taken on extra importance of late as growth slowdowns have become more persistent across these countries. Not surprisingly, China is the biggest economy by far of the grouping, has been the prime target of investigation in relation to the MIT, with many authors attempting to attribute China's recent slowdown and prospect of future slowdowns to the conditions associated with the trap. Indeed, China has pushed out Latin America as the new focus for the middle-income trap literature, with papers such as Eisen Green et al. pointing out the human gap capital gap which China possesses and recommending larger, better targeted government spending. Given the experience of China and the reality facing the rest of the BRICS, the purpose of this paper is to examine both the conceptual underpinnings of the middle income trap and its policy prescriptions in relation to the BRICS countries. This analysis casts a critical eye towards the idea of a middle income trap as a new or even useful concept in international development. Using case studies from the BRICS countries themselves, I show instead that the effects commonly attributed to the MIT are nothing more than old wine and new bottles, predicted by standard growth and economic theory. More importantly, these issues do not require innovative, innovative, or new structural approaches to overcome them, but a reliance on two simple fundamentals, prudent macroeconomic policy and fostering effective economic institutions. Indeed, the danger of the MIT literature is that it purports to other, offer countries a way to leapfrog these prerequisites. Examining these two dimensions in the context of the BRICS countries, we will be able to distill effective recommendations for policymakers to avoid the MIT. Okay, so a brief look at the concept. So, let's see. So, this is just so that we are aware of this thing. Okay, this is probably going to be too long to read every, the whole thing. Uh, okay. Let's see. Few countries manage to achieve high levels of sustained growth for over a generation. Even two of these countries continue the high growth rates once they reach middle income. Okay. Okay. So, as a first step, Felipe calculated that it was necessary for a country to become high income. The paper showed that a country that becomes lower middle income has to attain an average growth rate of per capita income of at least 4.7 per annum to reach upper middle income, while a country that thus attains this level has to show an additional average growth rate of per capita income of at least 3.5% per annum to graduate to high income. Where the trap comes in is, as Hill and Kairos predicted, where growth rates do not equal the escape velocity needed to break free of the current level of development and grow towards high income status. Indeed, evidence that has been accumulating the so-called growth slowdown literature that these rates of growth have generally not been achieved in emerging markets since the trap. 
and countries that once did grow at a rapid pace have stalled out within the middle income bound. It is here that much recent research has been devoted to explaining this phenomenon. I should agree I'll examine the consequences of possible diminishing growth rate in China by examining other recent episodes of growth slowdowns and found that on average high growth rates came to an end at a per capita GDP of 16,740 for countries in their sample, dropping from 5 or 6 per annum to about 2.1. The theorized reason for the slowdown is that poorer countries are characterized by a large pool of unskilled labor that, as part of the first wave of growth, is transferred from subsistence level occupations to more modern manufacturing or service activities that do not require much upgrading of these workers' skills, but nonetheless employ, enjoy, employ higher levels of capital and embedded technology, such as heavy industry. Under this conception of growth, poor countries are able to utilize existing technologies that have already been created in richer countries to aid and embed their own growth. By applying these new technologies to existing stock of labor, a country gained the advantage of both increasing to returns for a given level of labor skills without the need for investment in these skills to upgrade. This in turn creates a competitive advantage for the country that can produce goods at a much lower labor cost. The catch, however, is that a country may only coast on the developed world's technology for so long. Moreover, this approach carries the seeds of its own demise. Assuming that there is a large pool of unskilled labor, once it is drawn into medium-skilled sectors that are aided by technology, the pool of surplus labor shrinks rapidly, leading to excess demand, wage growth, and inevitably a loss of labor cost competitiveness. Ahagor and Canudo use an overlapping generations model that focuses on the composition of the labor force itself, showing that the same technological forces that drove the initial changes in the economy feed out, along with sustained growth. Modeling the choices of workers to enhance their own skill set, constrained by the availability of both basic and advanced infrastructure, such as broadband access, the model finds that there are several scenarios where an economy can be caught in a low-growth equilibrium. Most crucially, where their network effects that require a certain mass of people to be in a profession before it can take off, e.g. having the first telephone is still quite useless until other people whom you want to talk to also acquire them, a country might be caught in a trap where highly educated and skilled workers have the talent going to waste because the critical mass hasn't been reached yet. Thus, with no incentive for workers to move into newer fields and or utilize new technology that might already might exist, the country path of the the growth path of a country stagnates. In the words, persistent growth slowdowns coincide with a point in the growth process where it is no longer possible to boost productivity by shifting additional workers from agriculture to industry, and where the gains from improving foreign technology diminish significantly. A critique of the trap part one. Where is the novelty? The recent focus on the MIT and the corresponding empirical research isolating its boundaries has highlighted an important phenomenon in the growth of nations. However, there still remain many issues with the way the MIT is currently framed that make this concept somewhat problematic for policymakers. The three main issues are lack of originality, timing is everything, what about institutions? Um, the first and possibly most damning criticism that come from an economist is that the MIT, at least encapsulated in the current literature, is perhaps not really a new phenomenon. Growth slowdowns are part and parcel of the economic growth theory. Indeed, diminishing marginal returns is the fact underpinning all of economics. As standard growth models predict convergence uh, or a more rapid rate of growth from a lower income levels to higher income that tapers off as countries become more prosperous. The basic lessons of the solo growth model as taught to, many, to any macroeconomic class and stressed by empirical research from the 1990s is that countries converge to their own steady state and thus have normal periods of slow growth. The reason behind the slowdown can also be traced back to diminishing marginal returns as accumulation of capital to labor can only take a country so far. During the period of increasing accumulation, economic gains, gains can be brilliant, but they rarely last long in the long run. Uh, they rarely last in the long run. Eventually, there are not enough workers to run all the machines. This point, made in the context of the Soviet Union by Paul Krugman and East Asia by Al Wen Young, is that the rise in participation rates, investment to GDP ratios, and educational standards, and the intersectoral transfer of labor from agriculture to other sectors, e.g., manufacturing with higher value added per worker, can get a country to a certain level, but then it takes technological change to push the frontier even further. To be fair, this point has been anticipated by some examining the MIT. The World Bank echoed the research of Aisha Green and Al 2012 in noting that the evidence of the MIT is based on productivity growth slowdowns. Thus, 85% of the slowdown rate and the rate of output growth can be explained by a slowdown in the rate of total factor productivity growth rather than by decreasing marginal returns to investment in physical capital, as a simple neoclassical growth model would suggest. Okay, so, so it really is that. It's again the uh, slowdown in the rate of total factor productivity growth. Earlier attempts to quantify growth slowdowns from the Inter-American Development Bank also trace the per capita income gap of Latin America on average to one in total factor productivity growth since the 1970s, while differences in factor accumulation are shown to be less important. Okay, total factor productivity instead of factor accumulation. This finding confirmed work from Solomano and Soto, who showed that productivity trends in the region followed a secular decline during the second half of the 20th century, reaching an all-time low with the debt crisis in the 1980s. During the years following this episode, productivity growth either collapsed or even turned negative. In contrast, factor accumulation provided a relatively stable contribution to growth. 
both during expansion and recession years. Indeed, Ashton Green Al found that the residual of total factor productivity falls from unusually high levels of 3% plus in periods of high growth to virtually zero in slowdowns. Okay, so so wait, so factor productivity, okay, which much lower declines correspond to capital and labor accumulation. Okay, so factor productivity. Okay, it is usually measured as the ratio of aggregate output, e.g. GDP, to aggregate inputs. Under some simplifying assumptions about produ the production technology, growth in total factor productivity becomes a portion of growth in output not explained by growth in traditionally measured inputs of labor and capital used in production. TFP is calculated by dividing output by the weighted geometric average of labor and capital input with a standard weighting of 0.7 for labor and 0.3 for capital. Hi, hi, Peter Parker. So I'm just, it's, this is not very fun. I'm, I'm sort of looking at sort of unfun economic stuff. You might be the only person here because nobody else has commented for quite some time. Um, so it accounts for the for part of the differences in cross-country per capita income. For relatively small, small percentage changes, the rate of TFP growth can be estimated by subtract, subtracting growth rates of labor and capital inputs and the, oh, hi, ER Explorers. Okay, well, good to hear from the growth rate of output. So if it'd be good if you can actually figure out how how this works. So not just at Peter um, Parker 371 high two. But the equation be equation below is often used to represent total output as a function of total factor productivity capital input. So A is total factor product so output is Y output. Is. Factor productivity is A capital so I'm just looking at economics basically. Um I'm just sort of looking at trying to understand like why we're basically looking at South Africa and then we're we're looking at why like growth is like was has been stagnating in South Africa and then there's a theory about middle income trap and so then there's an article sort of criticizing the concept of middle income trap and so this is what we're sort of looking at here uh so total factor productivity a capital income input k labor input Okay, so yeah, and the two inputs, so it's A times K, A times L, B, and so wait, and the two inputs respective shares of output, A, alpha and beta, sorry, are the share of contribution for K and L respectively. As usual for equations of this form, an increase in either A, K, or L will lead to an increase in output. Um, okay. Okay, for an average country, the TFP accounts for 60% of growth of output per worker. Okay. So, hmm. So then there's some criticisms. Lacking meaningful uh, units of measurement. The units of the quantities in the Cobb Douglas equation are Y, wait, L, but we don't even know what Y. Oh, wait, or are that, yeah, widgets. <laughs> widgets. Just read your stream title. I didn't actually support Trump in the election. <laughs> I really don't like the guy. But I would have preferred a second Trump term over identity oh, yeah. politics, just because I think identity politics is so bad. So that makes me demonic. Well, in pra you know, in practice, you know, the, the point is that you're you're failing to properly understand that basically the Democratic Party. If you vote for the Democratic Party, you're not voting all that much for identity politics. You're voting for mostly economic policies that will be, uh, you know, and, and government policies that mostly have nothing to do with e identity politics, but will that will definitely help out the average person. I mean, if you if you look at the Trump sort of administration, the Trump presidency, his policies were just in were, were just terrible. They're just anti-environmental. And, and, and always he just kind of, uh, you know, he did everything he could to damage the environment in, in every way possible. He he did everything he could to hurt like gay and trans people in every way possible. Um, so like it's not about identity politics. It's just about making life better for people. If you look, I mean, I looked at this yesterday and this is what gave me the, the idea to write this title here is that Trump is just it's just horrible. You look at the Trump presidency, like this, like everything he did was, was like bad. He, I mean, even the, like the fucking wall, like, OK, you can have your opinion or not about immigration, but like. Uh, like you don't need to I, I don't like the idea of building walls okay i just i don't like even just like conceptually visually um 
And like literally, if these people are immigrating, it's because they're super poor, which means that literally, the, like literally, they, they should be richer. Uh, the U.S. interfered with them a lot for a long time. In any case, these countries are pretty small, so literally, the U.S. can could very easily afford to just let all Maybe these people my in. Take was wrong, yeah. but I don't like the term demonic. I have to say. Well, the point is that, uh, like, uh, you know, he, he also wants to limit health care to people. He, he like, separated little kids from their families. Like, the point is that in practice, it's demonic. You, you Maybe your intentions aren't demonic, but in practice, it's, it is demonic because Trump, Trump, his his actions are demonic. This is what I'm saying because they're, they're, they're very evil, okay? Trump is a really bad guy. Trump is a really bad guy. He's done really bad things. Um, like his entire policies are bad. And I'm not saying Biden is great, but in comparison to Trump, he's a saint. Okay. In comparison to Trump, he's a saint. You want to go? I would agree. Do you want to go Trump back? Is a bad guy. Do, 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 do you want to go? Okay. Wait, no. Trump. Trump presidency. This is already what I was looking yesterday, but I'll I'll go back. So th thank you for saying that. I don't like identity politics either, but voting for Democrats is not really voting for identity politics. I mean, sure, most of the Democrats support identity politics, but by and large, like they're not going to do much about it. You know, it's not like you sort of in Congress, they're saying, let's vote for more identity politics. You know, there there's not all that much. Like if you look at most of the policies and stuff that's being discussed, it's not identity politics. Like the, the whole thing is like just a distraction. You see what I mean? Like the whole after what happened after the election, especially at January sixth, I would <laughs> want Trump anymore. Look, he imposed tariffs on solar panels, right? And meanwhile, he wanted to subsidize coal more. So he just wanted to keep he wanted to keep producing more fossil fuels. He hurt I the the solar panel. And... So yeah, so I, I'm glad to hear that. But this is what I'm this is what I'm telling you is that um um. He did. He he cut taxes I for the rich. My element with this Wikipedia page's attempt to mathematically model such a complex system. Conversation is completely different by the time I could finish this thought. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Me. Me too. Me too. Uh. Obviously, the, these economic stuff is kind of, is kind of hard to to understand. Uh, but I, I. I. Yeah. I. I know. Um. Yeah. Puerto Rico. He failed to provide proper sort of prompt relief. Um, capital punishment, the most federal executions ever. He did some pardons to people, but it was just for his friends. Uh, drug policy, uh, more, uh, he, he, the administration ordered federal prosecutors to seek maximum sentencing for drug offenses. Um, here, pardon or commuted the sentences of 237. Most of these pardons had per personal political connections to Trump. Um, Let's see again. Cracking down on crime, which again, I'm, pr I, I am. Trump was pro gay marriage in the year 2000. Obama spoke against it while running for president in 2008. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Trump and the Republican billionaires cut the taxes for themselves. That this was illegal still triggers me. Look, I, I, I know Trump was like the point is that now Trump is just trying to to pander to his his con current constituents. Um, like you know, I don't think he, Trump he that much cares necessarily about these things, but he just does all the nasty stuff that the the Republicans want. Plus, the the real problem is not Trump. The real problem is Trump voters. Uh, I mean, really, that twenty twenty two. The real problem is is Trump voters. I, I want you to demonstrate, you know, if you don't know what to do, make a sign saying no Trump voters, stop, stop voting for Trump and stop, like, stop supporting Trump, stop supporting the Republican Party and stop supporting identity politics, which is racist and which is not progressive. Um, look, agriculture. So he subsidized agriculture. I don't support that because then that means that the poor countries aren't competitive and they can't even sell their own products. Uh, here he made it easier. He uh, reversed a rule that made it easier for grief consumers to pursue class actions against banks. Um, so, for instance, you know, uh, he uh, uh, what, what was it? He scrapped a proposed rule from the Obama administration that air, airlines disclose baggage fees. Um, like literally, literally, like it, it just it, just one terrible thing after another, one terrible thing after another. Um, like oh, and what was it? There's like one, one good thing is like his admin vote for candidates on the basis that they're lying and won't want to try to do what they say they will. I can understand that strategy, but I'm nauseated by it. 
what? What what do you what what are you talking about? Air explorers. I, I I'm not understanding. Yeah, no. At the time, if he was pro, yeah, he was pro gay marriage at the time. At the time, it would have made sense to vote for Trump. At the time, and even even in 2016, he said he would, he said he would, um, like he would support gay marriage and stuff. But at the same time, he was he was you know engaging all sorts of nasty like, you know, xenophobic rhetoric and stuff. So you could already tell that he would be an asshole, you know, um, and like so, yeah. Immigration, so he's got his wall thing. He he sort of come, you know consistently demonized immigrants. He consistently, you know, we there's a class, you know, famous family separation thing. But to me, um, it's important to grant other people a different parents, point of view. E.g., it's completely all right if we disagree on things, and I don't know if I'm right on my opinions. Chances are good on many things, but I do have a problem with the word demonic. Well, that's good that you have a problem. It makes you, it makes you sort of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's an irritant, you know, it's like, it makes you want to do something. It's like an oysters create a pearl when they've got a piece of sand in them and they're not happy about it. Like this is, it, this is good. You know, it, it makes you, it, it, it makes you sort of want to, 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 to question so, other people and like yourself. Clickbait. Well, not just, no, not just clickbait. It's also like, I mean, yes, it's clickbait, but it's, it's also that I, I want you to get a bit frustrated so that you sort of be, be sort of more, you know, that you have a more of a, a desire to think about things. You see, um, this is what I mean. Um, parents were routinely charged with misdemeanor and jailed. The children were placed in separate detention centers with no established procedure to track them or reunite them with their parent after they had served time for their offense. Ago, but you Generally, only a few hours a day. Support identity politics. Yeah. I feel that term is outdated by about 10 years now. Haven't heard it in a few, but that Democrats won't act on it. Well, the, I, what I mean well, is... I disagree on the demonic thing. <laughs> I might be wrong on my political opinions, but I reject the notion that I'm demonic. Well, like separating little kids and with having without having any sort of plan to to reunite them, uh, that is that is like super demonic. I, I I'm sorry. Like I'm I'm not sorry. Like literally, like like literally that is that is terrible. Okay, that is this is terrible. If if only for that, even if the rest was was okay. Just that already is, is terrible. By November 2020, the parents of 666 children see the number of the devil. <laughs> no, okay, I'm, I'm joking, but yeah, it still had not been found. Uh, but they, they pr presumably they did that on purpose. But like, <laughs> I mean, they, Sorry, presumably Wikipedia did. The question I really originally wanted to ask: What is a demon? Just a bad person, basically a person who intentionally does uh, and causes suffering to other people. I mean, that's kind of in the Bible, right? The demons are there to, like, make you suffer in hell and stuff. I'd say a demon is just somebody who intentionally makes other people suffer just out of sadism. And I would, or just out of even just complete callousness. Uh, and, and Trump is that, and Trump voters are that. Um, so, so yes. Uh, let's I know what a sadist is. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so. Trump is demonic. <laughs> And I never supported all he did. I just preferred him over identity politics. But that doesn't make me demonic. The, my point is that voting for Trump, you're voting for all those horrible policies. If you vote for the Democrats, you're not really voting for identity politics. You're voting for the policies that the Democrats vote in, which by and large have nothing to do with identity politics and largely have to do with just making life better for everyone. Th this, is, this is my point. Um, yeah, they, they all, there also is identity politics sort of rhetoric, but by and large, by and large, their policies are not identity politics. You, you want to see a presidency well, of, of Biden, voting but for Biden, you also vote for identity politics and those things can be evil too. Yeah, but it's not, not, it's, it's at least it's, kind, it's wrong, but it's in a sort of well-meaning way, as opposed to like separating children, which is wrong in just a completely unwell-meaning way. Um, like 
Biden, what did he do? First, he 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 rejoined Paris Accords. He stopped the uh, Keystone drilling in Alaska. So he sort of and you know he's proposed all sorts of you know pro environmental stuff. He's like supported he supported infrastructure building plans. You know for basically uh, you know shifting towards a cleaner energy production uh, and infrastructure sort of revamping, which is all like good stuff. Uh, and there he like he want to get out of Afghanistan. Of course, uh, Trump kind of wanted that too, but like we're doing that under Biden uh, for finally completely fin finalizing the, the pullout of Afghanistan. He, uh, you know, he's much more in favor of like helping, you know, like, and, you know, combat discrimination against like gay and trans people, et cetera. Um, you know, he reinstated the, the authorization of, uh, the, of trans people to serve in the military, for instance, uh, which is, you know, which is not much of a thing really, but symbolics, symbolically, I think it's important uh what did what did he do there um i'm presumably yeah he he offered aid to central americas to limit the, the root causes of migration right which i think is a good thing he offered like a way to, to a pathway for citizenship for illegal people in the united states he um uh let's see uh, he re um uh, increased uh, i think corporate tax rates uh although not quite as high as they were before trump he uh i i actually don't support corporate tax rates so like Okay, I, I don't actually support that, but the point is the idea of not just letting Sorry, rich people do better. Yeah. But I really don't know if I want to have a discussion with someone who calls me demonic. Well, I don't want to have a discussion with somebody who thinks it's okay to permanently separate children from their parents. Like, uh, this is what I'm saying. If you support him, I'm not saying if you if you voted for him the first time, you didn't know what he was going to do. That's understandable. But if you support, still support him now, then yes, you are demonic. I, I th that's just that's just the fact. Um, if you just voted for him because you didn't really know much, uh, and Never you didn't know, said I'm okay with separating children. Okay, well then you're maybe not demonic. My point, this is my my point. My point is if you support like Trump and everything he's done, then then that makes you a bad person. If you just voted for him originally without without sort of knowing what you do and just because you're sort of pissed off with identity politics, that's a different matter. OK, um, but I, I clearly said if you support Trump, you're demonic. I didn't say if you support some of Trump's policies, you're demonic. OK, but if you support Trump overall, yes, then, then that is not good because Trump is not a good person. He has done I've really never supported anything anyone's ever done, including myself. <laughs> See, so rolled back numerous LGBT protections here. They did all sorts of, they, they prosecuted much less sort of, um, you know, um, like uh, cases of like, you know, oppression of, the, of uh, these people. Um, Everything anyone's they, ever done, asterisk LUL, sorry. They, they removed all the, they, they removed all the, yeah. Wait. What you said? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Everything. Okay. Now I get it. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Let Let's see. Let's see. Science. Let's see. Science. Um. You know they got rid of all all. See, the Department of Energy prohibited the use of the term climate change. Um. Like literally, they just completely On rolled back hand, all all like. Say limitation you climate change Trump, stuff you also support separation of children on the other hand you say if you vote for biden you don't support that much the identity politics stuff that's inconsistent well no i, I said if you support trump like i if you support trump in his entire persona like i don't support everything about biden i don't support everything about biden you can vote for him like i voted for him doesn't mean I wholeheartedly support him and everything. The problem is that lots of people like Trump fans and they think he's great in all ways. That is that is wrong. That is what I mean. Okay. Um, again, it would be wrong to fully support Biden too. Um, but mostly, I mean, for from my perspective, it's not even so much the identity politics thing. It's more like he doesn't. He's not trying to implement a basic income, and I support basic income. For me, it's more like that. But, um, but. Um, and he's not really fighting for, you know, uh, state paid health care, uh, which is also what I'd advocate for. For So for me, the problem is that he, he's still too much of a just, just typical right winger. Hey, uh, let's not hate each other over voting. 
it doesn't actually mean us lowly voters even have our vote counted much less mean that we're ruling over each other. Yeah, but the point is that it's still important to vote for the right the right stuff. Um so like basically basically uh here the Trump administration shifted US policy and declared the establishment of Israeli civilian settlements in the West Bank is not per se inconsistent with international law. Uh so this is like yeah. Again, so he's doing all this sort of this shit. Um he said, called for a major buildup of American military capabilities. Uh, the world would, uh, he announced that America would withdraw from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia to enable America to counter increasing Chinese intermediate nuclear missile capabilities in the Pacific. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Trump said the is spending on the arms race is crazy after praising his increased defense spending five months earlier. Stuff, so this is again the right candidate, and I'm not the right one either. Well, the point is that pretty much any candidate other than Trump is the right candidate. Like literally, the reason Trump is so popular among Republicans is because all the basically among all the people that Trump is popular with. The reason he's popular is because those people are, are bad people and like literally they just love everything that is bad. They love evil. Then this is what I'm saying about demonic. If you actually particularly like Trump more than like any other candidate, that means that you're just a really bad person. Like you're just a really evil person. You're like a fucking murder or something. You're like just a, uh, yeah, this is what I say. Like you're a demon that has sprung forth from hell to, to destroy the world. Doesn't mean that. Um, yeah, it does mean that. The, this is still to me it's an important thing in discourse to grant other people to have a different point of view even if they are wrong i'm probably wrong in lots of things yeah no i agree i agree but the point is that sometimes being wrong then you'll vote for something that's wrong and people will suffer horribly from that being wrong i mean the point is that you should you can be wrong about your sort of idea of what you think is going to be beneficial for more people but you can't you cannot at least have different ethical standards. You cannot, for instance, support like huge amounts of torture and huge amounts of unfairness. You know, that is ethically wrong, for instance, you know, that is ethically wrong. And if you support that, you're just you're a bad person. And this is what your typical Trump voter supports. Um, your typical Trump supporters, it basically, they they don't care about other people. They're literally happy to see other people suffer and uh, in fact, an inf infinite amount of suffering, right? Like, literally, they, they're, these are the people who also believe in, like, a god that sends people to hell for no good reason. So, obviously, they're okay with just the most horrible things. So, they are literally horrible, horrible people. Um, and that is not, that is not, you cannot have a civil discourse uh, about that. You, like, literally, I mean, I mean, you can. I disagree. Trump supporters want people to suffer. I th they do because most most Trump supporters believe uh, support the idea of hell and want that people that they think are bad to suffer in hell forever. So yes, they do want people to suffer and not just a little bit, but like infinitely. So they're infinitely evil. Um, so yeah, I um, again, this is my point. You have to you have to understand how bad they are. It's like the Nazis. And you imagine if after like World War II, people said, oh, they're not so bad. You know, they're just, no, we, we, we demonized them. And it was for a reason, for a good reason, the Nazis were demonized because they are demons. They, it's actually not we that demonized them. It's that they demonized themselves by being. literally compare Trump supporters to Nazis? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think Trump supporters are ruling and media classes in the United States speak as if they want to exterminate millions of good people. You're speaking as if you want millions of people to be considered as non-persons, demons, ripe for genocide. You are advocating no, genocide right now. I'm not. They advocate for genocide, okay? This is also like they don't advocate so much for ge just passive genocide. They advocate for policies that will make just people die of, of poverty. In fact, each year, they're like 10 million extra, the equivalent of 10 million people being killed a year just because of economic uh, inequalities. So so they are just doing passive genocide. They are committing passive genocide. Um, yeah, hmm, this is interesting. The speech chat is not making any noise. Sorry. I'm off for now. So here at Dina Thanel. Bye you guys. Stay healthy, y'all. Okay.
All right, You're bye bye. Advocating for more active genocide then? No, what I'm saying is that they are the ones committing the genocide, and I'm not advocating for active genocide. I'm saying that they should not be. Basically, their opinions are immoral, and we cannot let them have their say. This is more what I'm saying. You just have to. You cannot take them into account. Like literally, I don't believe in democracy for for those people. Uh, democracy only works when you have good people. You like democracy of of demons of orcs, as I also call them, it is not is not something I value. I don't think orcs should be given a vote. I don't think I don't think the the well, servants I don't think servants of the devil should be should be allowed to vote. Um, but the point is obviously you can't. It's not possible to implement a system that's not democratic. So the point is you just need to to create enough popular. Uh, you know, or create enough understanding among enough people that, that the bad people should be allowed to vote. Yeah, the, what you need to do is make enough people understand that being like a Republican is a bad thing, that the Republican Party just falls into obsolescence so that you don't need. I mean, this is the point is if if you need to, like, be authoritarian, leftist, but... if you need to be authoritarian, then you probably won't. It won't probably won't work. Right. Because then it means that you in a democracy, if you need to be authoritarian, it means that the majority doesn't agree with you. And which means that then you're the majority is probably also going to be stronger than you. So if, on the other hand, if, uh, you know, if you're able to be authoritarian, it means that you're the majority, which means that you don't have any need to be authoritarian. Right. Mm -hmm. Because because you're already the majority and you can just have your way through through voting. Um, I I. I'm not leftist. I, I just believe, in any case, this is a very theoretical. So you don't think democracy is a good thing? That's not true. I didn't say that. Everybody to have his vote. I, d I didn't say that. I said in, pra in, in theory, in theory, if we could just have the best person to just dictate everything to uh, for, for now, that would be even the best. But um, the, the problem is, how, how do you do that? So no, a democracy is obviously the best system. But the problem is that democracy works very poorly if the majority of the population. People shouldn't have their vote. Well, the the point is that yeah, I mean, the point is that democracy doesn't work well when you have evil people. When a majority of the people are evil, then it like democracy doesn't work well. So you you just you're kind of stuck, right? Because you're kind of stuck. That there's no there's no ideal solution when. Who decides who is evil and who's not? Well, that is a problem. Is that the evil people won't agree with their characterization the of being evil? Is just not um, making sense for me, but I'm up late. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, my point is that there there are better people than others, but the evil people won't recognize it. And if the evil people are majority, then they they'll probably also be more powerful. And so, in practice, you're not going to manage to to impose anything, and uh, so this is not really going to work. So this is why what you have to do in practice is is just make the evil people understand that they're evil and make them no longer be evil you make them you make them repent and change their ways uh this is this is what what needs to be done and th this is what I, I would hope to see happen is that they just recognize that uh, they're evil and, and stop don't separate people into categories as evil and good well it's not so much about categories it's not so much the people specifically it's their beliefs is that they should drop their evil beliefs is that you have good good beliefs and evil beliefs and if you hold evil beliefs, well, you're evil. Then if you drop those evil beliefs, then you're no longer evil, uh, and then you're good. This is this is what I'm this is what I'm saying. Um, so you just need to what you need to do is make people drop their evil beliefs. That's all. I, this is all I'm saying. And you need to do it by making them understand the evilness of their beliefs. So there needs to be a process of like activism that makes you know uh, in, in all sorts of ways. But you just need to you need to have like a movement that helps them understand that you know that what they believe in is wrong and and this is this is what i'm talking about and trump trump you can see that everything that he did he did was was basically bad um like okay this wikipedia probably is somewhat biased uh yeah uh but it's probably not mentioning the like the good things um uh of the trump presidency but like Who the point is that what's an evil belief and what's an acceptable belief Sorry, but that's completely anti-democratic. Yeah, and so, for instance, is the concept of a constitution. The constitution is anti-democratic. The point is that there's some fundamental values that are 
good and not. If you don't believe if you don't believe in absolute values, then that's moral relativism, and moral relativism is just idiotic because it means that you literally can justify anything. So there are absolute ethical principles. One is the limitation of suffering. That's the number one ethical principle. Is the utilitarian principle of minimizing suffering, of maximizing well-being. That is the fundamental ethical principle, and then it should be done, of course, in a fair fashion. So sort of relatively you know, in an equal way, as much as possible, you should try to minimize suffering and maximize well-being. And then there's a principle of autonomy so that people should be sort of allowed to do what they want to do if it doesn't interfere with those other principles um, or with any in, with those principles for anyone else. Like, uh, you know, as long as you don't hurt other people, you should be free to do whatever you want. So those are the, the fundamental ethical principles. If you, there are you know, if they're decisions that obviously violate those principles, then those are wrong decisions and those are evil. Um, so, like, th th that, th that should be pretty obvious, right? Democracy like, doesn't work if you have a majority of people yeah. that are evil. Yeah. That's where the concept of original sin can actually help. Giving everyone equal humility, not in an abject way, but know that everyone commits at least mildly evil acts and that everyone needs forgiveness. Yeah. Everyone always already needs to repent and change their ways. Yeah, it's true. Sure. But the point, the point is that some people are, are more evil than others. Some people have worse belief than others. And so like, this is, this is sort of what I'm saying. Like Trump, Trump was, um, Trump was pretty, was pretty terrible. Like he did lots of evil stuff, but at least like Biden compared to trump like all wh whenever trump and biden defer like like whenever biden and trump disagree well biden is pretty much systematically on the side of good and Bi and trump is pretty much systematically on the side of evil um uh were let's see were there any good policies from trump this would be this would be interesting um here the atlantic the things trump got right I would so never to claim that I'm a good person. How the hell would I know? Well, I can only good. Go with what feels right for See, me. that's completely wrong. That is the way most people think, and that's completely wrong. So what you should do is have a very, very uh, s s solid intellectual structure to determine right and wrong. And I told you that you should have these axioms uh, that that tell you what is right and wrong. And like you should believe in the prin utilitarian principle of minimizing suffering and maximizing well-being for everyone. Then you should believe in the principle of fairness for everyone uh, uh, and particularly fairness in terms of well-being. And you should believe in the concept of freedom for for everyone. And so th those are those are the fundamental ethical principles. And um, and this is what I'm. This is what I'm telling you. You should. You should definitely should not just go by your feeling. If you go by your feeling, you, then you'll often be wrong, and you'll end up being, uh, you'll being functionally evil. You'll be evil in practice, even if you don't intend to, simply because you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, so let's see. In a single term as president, George H. W. Bush negotiated the peaceful reunification of Germany. He liberated Kuwait while losing few American lives. He signed legislation to end acid rain. Okay. He did a budget deal that reduced federal deficits, enacted the Ameri Americans with Disabilities Act, and successfully resolved the collapse of the savings and loan industry. Wait, I told you that you're evil. Like, tell me your views. Like, literally, just tell me your views. Um, if you can tell me a specific view. I could be given like 12 to 24 hours preparation time, and I could give a speech at least an hour long. Maybe two or three about how evil they were and what all their evil acts were. And could do that for people other than U.S. presidents. Yeah, of course. Of course. Peter Parker, 371, sorry, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Look, Peter Parker, tell me a belief. I You haven't even told me. I told you that if you just voted for Trump without really thinking about it, then that would be wrong. But, like, just just tell me. Tell me something that you support, and then I can tell you if it's right or wrong. Like... I, I I don't know. And and yeah, if if you just go if you just like go by your feeling, you're at, you'll end up doing things that are wrong. And and that is going to be in practice it's going to be evil even if you don't mean to be evil. Um okay. Let's see. So that so you did that uh, that, that good stuff. Um I'll try to remember that. I'll try to remember that. Jimmy Carter in his one term deregulated passenger aviation. He updated the regulation of rail freight, shipping, and trucking, laying the foundation for America's modern delivery system. 
He negotiated the Camp David Accords, ending belligerency between Egypt and Israel. He avoided major crisis in Central America with the Panama Canal Treaty. William Howard Taft also achieved much in his one term as president. It was his Department of Justice that busted the standard oil monopoly. Taft forcefully advocated a central bank for the United States, although that project was not completed until the year after he lost the presidency to Woodrow Wilson. Taft urged free trade with Canada and negotiated the treaty that ended a century of across North American waterway disputes. Yeah. To say the least, Donald Trump is not a president in the league of Bush, Carter, or even Taft. Few presidents have left office with so little accomplished, impeached, and disgraced. Trump took a lot of credit for the economic growth of his first three years, but the economy was already growing strongly when he took office. Yeah, that was that was my point, is that that was like the good thing about the Trump presidency, but like it was already growing. Pick a measure, almost any measure, and the trajectory of his first three years was identical to the act of Barack Obama's final three years. Unemployment, manufacturing, wages, you name it. And whereas Obama passed a successful economy to Trump, Trump bequeaths a wreck to his successor. Okay, but it's true that there's COVID. Um... The Trump tax cut promised to accelerate long-term growth by stimulating business investment. That promise was broken. Business investment did not rise. The Trump tax cut imposed indefinite trillion-dollar deficits upon the United States even before the pandemic crisis, while conferring little, if any, benefit on economic output. Trump's trade policy was another fiasco, and his much ballyhooed U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement simply inserted more automobile protectionism into the old NAFTA without addressing the big North American trade issues of the 21st century, especially the needs of the digital economy and cross-border shipping. Uh, Trump did appoint a lot of judges, but that was a partisan achievement, not a national one, a zero-sum win for conservative Americans, not a legacy for the nation as a whole. Yet nobody does nothing as president, not even someone who watches television for five or six hours a day. There were achievements in the Trump years, and even if they hardly begin to compare to Jimmy Carter's, they are still worth noting to as this presidency comes to an end. I've below tallied a Barker's dozen of accomplishments that a majority of Americans, Democrats as well as Republicans, can reckon as successes of the Trump era. Stricter regulation of vaping. Vaping technology can help adult smokers quit, but it can also lure teenagers into addiction. In January 2020, Trump signed regulations restricting the use of fruit and mint flavorings in vaping cartridges. This was not as bold an action as anti-tobacco groups sought, but it was not nothing either. Trump almost immediately regretted his benign action. Two weeks later, he complained on the phone on to Health Sec Secretary Alex Azar, I should never have done that fucking vaping thing. But the policy remains despite Trump's change of heart. So this is the point, like, the, the few things that Trump did well, that the Trump, that Trump presidency did well, like, he didn't even agree for it like there was a thing apparently the trump presidency so there's this growth but that wasn't even thanks to trump there was apparently the fact that his administration um uh advocated against homophobia across the world they, there's some sort of thing that they did that and trump apparently wasn't even aware of that um and, and now there's this thing also article from the atlantic yeah i'm leading atlantic saying that it, what the trump did well they're saying what the trump did well Dramatic reductions in the burning of coal. Coal is the most environmentally dangerous of all fuels. But the point is that the reductions were despite the fact that Trump actually uh, supported doing more coal. It doesn't matter that's from the Atlantic. I looked at the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal also just said exactly what Trump did. He like this is these are just facts. The like it doesn't matter. Like I could go to the Wall Street Journal, it would be the same. Um, so I can even if you want, then you know find the name Jimmy Subbill? You mean that that guy that sort of molested uh, the guy that the the BBC uh pers persona that uh like molested a bunch of little children, yeah? Is this what you're? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Why? Please don't tell me that you're saying like, oh, Jimmy Savile molested children, so all the non-extreme right Republican um, media is a child molesters. I know it through the media talking about him, because then he, then it got you know it got sort of leaked that he did this. Um, how for so long. What do you mean? How for so long? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. But so somehow this is just all media that isn't extreme right media, like Fox News, is is, is like a part of a part of a like pedophile conspiracy. And meanwhile, like the the far right news is like all they're just nothing but angels, right? This is what you're saying. No. Like. <laughs> um, yeah, because because there was a he was able to sort of hide the thing, and there's like a bit of complicity I'm in certain things. That. Yeah, well, thank thank God, because I know that lots of people would be saying that. Um, 
yeah, the media is corrupt. The mainstream media is is somewhat, uh, you know, it's got some nasty aspects to it. Sure, sure. Um, it's still better than Fox. Um, uh, I mean, and anyway, the Savile thing, like, like it's it was th that thing, and most people did not know about what Savile was doing. Uh, and like, yeah. I don't watch Fox or TV. Yeah, sure. You don't, but lots of people do. Uh, but you maybe watch some other equivalent stuff. Uh, I don't know. Um, so instead, U.S. coal consumption declined in every year of his... He said that the point is that Trump said he would burn more, but instead U.S. coal consumption declined in every year of his presidency. In 2019, the U.S. burned 586 million tons of coal, a reduction of almost 50% from the 2007 peak, and a drop of almost 15% over 2018. This was not a result Trump wanted. A harder working president might even have thwarted it. But in this one crucial respect, Trump's legendary laziness has left the world a cleaner and greener place. So again, Trump's, he, Trump did good things unintentionally, like the Trump presidency ended up doing good things unintentionally. Normalization of the Middle East. President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem and proposed a peace plan. So that, again, that was a silly move. Um, well, not necessarily, but yeah, pr probably, presumably it was a sort of anti like Palestine provocation and proposed a peace plan that substituted economic development for immediate Palestinian statehood. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Wait. Traditional experts feel that Trump's policies would ignite regional conflicts. In instead, if anything, the region has calmed. First, the United Arab Emirates, then Bahrain and Sudan, and more recently, Morocco have opened diplomatic relations with Israel. It's not possible to fly direct from Tel Aviv to du Dubai over flying Saudi Arabia. Okay. Trump also bought... Brought long delayed justice to Iran's general Qasem Soleimani, author of so many acts of terrorism. Again, experts feel that the killing of Soleimani will trigger the direct direst consequences. Instead, the Iranian regime itself halted the cycle of retaliation after its own reckless mistake brought down a civilian airliner over Tehran airport, killing all 176 passengers and crew. Iranian authorities first lied about their responsibility. When the truth could be concealed no longer, outrage among the Iranian people shook the Mullah regime. Trump broke every rule in the diplomatic book. He accepted payments to himself and his family from the same parties he was negotiating with, not only single millions at his hotels, but the multiple millions in financing that his son-in-law's family received from the Qataris to retrieve a bad investment in a New York City office building. Trump showed blatant favoritism to the Israelis over other negotiating parties. He repeatedly surprised all involved with abrupt changes in U.S. policy, supporting the Kurds, betraying the Kurds, appealing to Turkey, sanctioning Turkey, provoking Iran, sanctioning Iran, withdrawing U.S. forces from the region, recommitting U.S. forces to region. At this one time, his seemingly aimless and herky-jerky approach worked. And this one time, his seemingly aimless and herky jerky approach worked, at least in the immediate term. Maybe Trump's vagaries frightened Israelis and Gulf Arabs into getting along better. Maybe a normalization would have happened even without him. It started before him, after all. Whatever the cause, he leaves office with his particular conflict closer to revolution resolution than when he entered office. Safeguarding 5G networks from Chinese control. But I do know that there's video of Jimmy Savile in his last days admitting to horrible crimes, and there were BBC journalists working on that and fighting to get that aired and broadcasted, but BBC Director General Mark Thompson kept trying to avoid them, and even after getting surprised at a party to finally hopefully get him on the record. Yeah, okay, sure, but that's, that's still in, does in no way absolve the, the far right media of anything they're they're also just uh, shills of billionaires uh, the point is that like fox if, if you're it, like fox and uh, you know like shapiro and like Cr you know crowder or whatever they're also the media that if you're gonna like say that the atlantic is somehow guilty by association then fox news and and shapiro are also guilty by association this is what i'm saying um Trump's trade policy lacked rhyme or reason. He provoked futile consumer harm and conflicts with partners like Canada and Germany. But Trump's campaign to build 5G networks on Western rather than Chinese technology is powered by abundant reason to secure communications in the democratic countries from Chinese surveillance and even Chinese sabotage. For once, Trump's motives were not narrowly nationalistic. The main alternative suppliers to China's Huawei are Sweden's Ericsson and Finland's Nokia. In 2018, Australia banned Huawei from its 5G networks. In June 2020, Canada and Singapore announced that they would rely on non-Chinese technology. The United Kingdom followed in July and even ordered the removal of Huawei components where they had already been installed. Hello, fellow alpha males. Oh, you're back. <laughs> I feared you might not come back after after a somewhat spat yesterday. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so, and yeah. And as you see, I, I held my word. I unbanned you. And even ordered the removal of Huawei components where they'd already been installed. My man. Well, I mean, I we can still be friends. 
Well, I mean, I, I guess I would be should be the one to apologize because I mean, I, I was. To absolve far right anything. I'm building up to why I am more skeptical of the Atlantic than you. Well, the po the point is that you should be skeptical of the Atlantic, but you should be at least as skeptical of something like Fox News or like the, the far right media. Like, you know, like, I, I don't know, like back in the day, Rush Limbaugh or something, you know, or Glenn Beck or or Alex Jones or, you know, Fox News or Ben Shapiro or Stephen Crowder or or any, you know, any of these people. You should be even more skeptical of them in many ways, if not maybe not necessarily always. Um, and, and and yeah, like uh, like I mean, I was the one who's harsh to you, so I mean, it should it, logically it would be me to apologize. I actually sorry to say I don't exactly apologize because like I feel it was my feel my 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 frustration was warranted. So my I guess what I'd rather say like apologize would also be recognizing that I did something wrong, and I don't think I really did something wrong. What I would rather say instead is that I, I um, uh, I I, did, I don't mean it to, to you know it's, I don't mean it out of malice, right? I, I, this it wasn't malicious. I'm not malicious. I'm doing it because I want to help people. When I the stuff I believe in, I uh, it's because I want to help people. And if I get you know if I get sometimes a bit mean, it's just because I get frustrated that people support policies that I think are going to hurt people. And so, and, and so th this is why I, I do it and, uh, and I'm going to keep on doing it and you're going to see with plenty of other people and you're going to see that I also have done it to, to left-wing people as well. I've had, I've had sort of similarly, uh, unpleasant exchanges with like, you know, pro, I, like the, the very same day, just before you came yesterday, I had a weird exchange with, um, the so-called tanky, you know, one of these people who support like uh, left-wing uh, sort of like Stalinism At and who supports like China. Day, we are both good people and we both think we are trying to help others. Well, uh, yeah, if, uh, I think that the most important thing is to want to help others. Yeah, I, understand. I think I have to try to gradually work through a lot of preconceptions. You, you've got to, you've got to, I think that's the most important thing is just you want to help others and but and so you you want the best for everyone but my point precisely is that like you have to not just want to help others like not just your family not just your country but even you know if there's an obvious policy that will help people in like some poor african country then you should also support that like you should you should want to help everyone and not just not just the ones closest to you um and, and yeah and, and if you have a different idea of how that should be done then that that does not make you a bad person. What would make you a bad person is if you're okay to just let people suffer, uh, or or even worse, actually enjoy seeing other people suffer. That that is really the the most important thing. You just want to have to make people stop suffering. Um, for, for me, that's the only ethical principle that, that I ask for. Really, I actually agree um, with you about borders and stuff. Oh, really? Okay. I just think it's not possible right now. Well, I agree that it's not possible right now. Like a um, battle against all of the schools, branches of the military, people allowed to be broadcasted at Astra. So, yeah, so I I appreciate you with, with saying that and I I appreciate you with um, you know, with your con your conciliatory stance here. Um, I I agree it's not possible, but what we have to ask yourself why is it not possible? And I think the reason is simply because people don't believe it's possible. And also because basically that, you know, you've got, I think lots of the really rich people, they, they like to use nationalism to deflect uh, the anger of the average person away from themselves and towards people in neighboring countries. This is the, the way that nationalism has been used for, for centuries. Um, to, Same as yeah. communism. I actually Wait. believe communism is the way of really? the future. Really? Really? I'm However, I'm it's not the way we should go right now. Oh really? I I actually don't I mean it's not exactly I mean my vision is pretty close to Marx's vision of communism but still in the future but it's still not actual communism either because like Marx's long-term goal was to have a society that would have no state and no money and i i don't Chad, the alpha, uh, male, L -O -L, yeah communism yeah what, what what do you mean actually by communism what i support in the long term is have everybody just on Once on a basic income advances enough, <laughs> we have worker robots yeah. doing all our labor then we can talk about communism yeah okay so you agree with this okay so that i'm i'm very glad to hear that lots of people don't actually see this but it, it makes complete sense to do this 
Um, and and that was Marx's vision too. And I think the point is that Marx had the wrong intermediary solution because he said before communism, you need socialism, and that in involves having like the government control the economy, years away. potentially just like one hundred years away. Uh, I think it could it could happen not that far in the future. Like literally, all you need is to have robots that are that have the same capacities as humans. Chad's the alpha male. That's not Marx's vision. It's Gene Roddenberry's cap. <laughs> but I, I don't even know who that is. But um, okay, presumably someone who talked about that. But no, it, it is Marx's vision. Except that Marx also said that we would do away with money. And I actually disagree with that. I think you just still give people money so that, and, and then that you'd have to still pay for stuff, but you just pay it to like, you know, robots, you know, um, you know, customer service robot people. And then those robots would just send the money back to the government and the government would send it, that money back to people in the form of basic income. Uh, and that's just a way to determine like how much you're allowed to buy. Because without money, you could just show up to the shop and... Is the creepy sex offender that founded Star Trek. Okay, okay. Like, you see, without money, you could just show up to a shop and say, well, give me everything. And then the shopkeeper would be like, okay, like, uh, you know, since we don't have money, I, there's no way for me to refuse. And, and so this is why why you need money. I mean, if we um, have robots mining resources from asteroids, literally everyone could live in a mansion. Yeah. For free. But I still think that you should have money just so that way it enables us to distribute, like, goods in a fair fashion. Like, that way everybody has the same purchasing power. Cause like, literally, otherwise, somebody could just, you know, come up to a giant palace and say, well, I want this for myself. And then people would be like, okay, like, you know, money is a great way of determining how to fairly allocate all the resources. Because even if you could have everybody living in a mansion, which I think you could, and this is exactly what, I, what I'm talking about. This is what you should have. But, but you still need, even if you have enormous amounts of resources, they still aren't infinite, which means you still need to figure a way of of fairly distributing the those resources and i think money still is the best way to do that which is why i don't think a moneyless society is, is a good idea i think you should always keep money just just for that um but yeah so so you agree with my long-term vision so i i'm glad about i'm glad to see that i'm and kind of surprised actually but um uh i'm glad about that and again i've been uh, you know, I've I've told you, right? I don't support these, uh, like I don't support the Chinese government. So I had this. I also had the sort of, uh, you know, uh, a rather heated conversation with a person who, um, supported China and who said China was doing actual socialism and that this was good and that China was too democratic and this was why China wasn't doing well. The most culturally and fantasy about not having money and he also had this idea that like money how capitalism series pre v Wade couldn't get away from falling back mm. on the concept of credits. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um like literally literally it's you were talking about something way more important no this, this is good but i, I like having this uh, this speech chat that way that way you can like you can see it and like that way it's sort of more like a conversation and my um, text to speech interrupted shutting up now oh yeah no but it's fine no yeah, i mean don't if otherwise i'll just turn off the text to speech also and then you can just write more if you want to write more um that that's fine too but um the my point is that that my point is that it's um, like, yeah, th this is weird how you've got these people who defend China and pretend that China is socialist and that then somehow China's like economic growth is a success of socialism, which is not true. And that then somehow this authoritarian is necessary to fight off the evil forces of capitalism. And that then he also said that like in like within 20 years, you'd have massive environmental collapse and massive like. Uh, billions of deaths from starvation because, or like not, or like you know from like whatever, uh, environmental problems because the because environmental services of like nature were no longer you know being pr performed you know because we're destroying nature and you know more environmental services and then everything's just going to be so toxic and stuff that everybody's going to die and I said like come on this is ridiculous this is ridiculous like in the very long term yeah. Uh, this is a po potential possibility, but like, it, it's like within millennia, not within, not within a few decades. It's not like literally 
things are, are getting better everywhere by and large. People are having more and more l- longer life expectancies. There's more uh, output in agriculture, and there's there's no sign of any like form of collapse. Like like that that's that's just nonsense. And, and he just somehow failed to 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 understand this. And so yeah, so th- this weird tanky eco Um And so I I completely oppose that. I I've had arguments with like all these racialist identity politics people um which i also like which i also disagree with um and somehow they really just don't get it how it's actually not really a great idea to to keep on perpetuating like uh racial you know sort of racialism and sort of differences between races and sort of trying to treat people differently according to their race like it's it's actually creates divisions between people and i tell them this and they just don't really get it um and so yeah this, this is, it's, it's always hard to to you know when people have like strong opinions it's it's always it's always hard um so so yeah so and, and anyway let, let's see so so what I, the point is that trump if, if you look at it like Okay, the Atlantic maybe has it it says of some few wrong things, but we saw that the Wall Street Journal basically agrees that like Trump did those things too, right? So like I think nobody is denying any of the stuff that we saw that that Trump did. Like Trump is literally just literally is what 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 is said in the Wikipedia. The the point is that what I did acknowledge is that maybe the Wikipedia article only focused on the bad stuff. I think it's biased in that sense. I don't think it's actually saying wrong stuff, but it, it probably fails to say the good things that the, the Trump administration did. So this is why today I decided to look at sources to say what did Trump actually do right. And so because this is written by the Atlantic, basically it's still making Trump seem like a fool, but maybe it's literally because there is not much that actually Trump did intentionally that was good but the point is that he said the administration or like his presidency ended up doing some good things but it's um only because only like because um like as a mistake like literally we saw this like literally all the all the good things trump really i'm just strongly anti-media yeah but they're almost all weasels but i agree i agree with that i agree um but the point is you've also got to recognize that like the, the sort of even the sort of alt right and not even fox but like you know people like like Shapiro or Crowder or people like that they are also that and and this is you, you just got to you got to realize that too um and lots of people don't like lots most people who complain about the, the mainstream media they think fox news on the other hand is telling them like the truth and that is a huge mistake um like like Fox News is the, the most weaselly of all weasels. I'm anti Fox. Um, okay. I'm anti Shapiro. I'm anti all of them. They are all chasing the dollar. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, good. I I commend you on that. And like and hopefully you realize also that I don't support like the sort of weird leftiness. You know. I mean, you you've seen me, right? I I you've seen what I've said about all this sort of weird lefty stuff. Uh, like. Yeah, I I don't support that. I don't support that. Um, so l- let's see, let's see. Um, uh, l- let's just let's just keep reading. If if this is uh, okay. Um, so yeah, so they they he did the stuff that uh, prevented China from from um you know spying, and that was actually intentional. So here is something that Trump did that was good, and that was actually um intentional. So you see, even the Atlantic, Atlantic is actually saying Trump intentionally did something good. Okay, so like, yeah, uh, let's so let's keep going. Appointment of Jerome Powell as Federal Reserve Chair. Janet Yellen's term as Chair of the Federal Reserve expired in Fender, February 2018. Trump refused to reappoint her, reportedly because he thought she was too short for the job. Jerome Powell, Trump's appointee, apparently met the president's aesthetic requirements. <laughs> Powell also proved a superb appointment just in time for the pandemic-caused economic crisis of 2020. The Senate was stingy with cash relief to the economy. Monetary policy had to do most of the lifting, and Powell was equal to the lift. Trump raved and ratted against Powell for not flooding the economy with liquidity in 2019, but when the economy's main problem was Trump's own tariff, when the economy's main problem was Trump's own tariffs. But Powell stepped up in 2020 with a policy that was both bold and unusual for any Trump appointee, internationally coordinated. 
And as so often happened, Trump later tried to sabotage his own good deed by adding extremists, misfits, and weirdos to the Federal Reserve Board. Points to the Republican senators who blocked those nominees, enhancing the clout of this rare, wise Trump appointment. Okay. But meanwhile, these, they also had a bunch of, of terrible appointments. Um, oh, and hey, actually, I'm curious, uh, Chad, did you, did you, have you learned any Thai? Have you learned any Thai? I've, I've been, I've been just very, I've been considering trying to, to start learning it. Um, I just had a quick look like yesterday and also uh, an earlier time. They're promising young adults to pursue advanced science degrees anywhere in the world. They people literally did their homework and gave funds to people trying to learn the most difficult subjects. Being from the USA, I got into engineering schools but was too scared to take out maybe $200,000 in loans. And this happened across the world at the best programs. The CCP supported their best students to be able to learn from across the world while U.S. policy was giving a few people at each university a ton of money while. Yeah, uh, the problem the problem is that these, these college, these universities are getting too expensive. Uh, and that is, that is a problem, definitely. Um, it's not exactly clear why it's doing that. I, I think you definitely should be able to make university cheaper. Maybe you have just like online degrees where you don't need so much in-person teaching, which could like really cut down enormously on costs without actually limiting the amount of learning that gets done. Um, I, I think it, I think it's definitely possible to to teach, you know, to like have college teaching for, for much less money. And uh, the problem is that much of these loans, the, the purpose, uh, I mean, much of them, the, the cost that you pay is like also associate professors and now probably not even that like, I would say that now, you know, the, the problem is that they also want to be able to fund their university, like, for research and stuff. And so your tuition is presumably going to be paying for that as well. Uh, so what I advocate for, again, is you, research. I think research should be paid for by the government. I don't think tertiary education should be paid for by the government, but research should be. And to make college cheaper. So I, I don't think college should be free. I don't think it should be paid for by the government or not even subsidized by the government. Still a communist devil. <laughs> I've never been a communist devil. Um but um let, let's see i i i don't like trump i don't like trump he he did like pretty much everything he did was terrible i don't like communism either and i've been saying this i don't like communism either Research except well it's one of the vaguest terms well you know like just all these sort of scientific like studies and stuff that gets done i think that that's sort of yeah it's, it includes lots of stuff and i think um and i and i think it should be that should be funded um yeah um let's see let's see is there is there <sighs> yeah i thought I think that's kind of covers it i think i covered what I, I need to say uh oh yeah to make college cheaper you just again you just have like online more online learning you can have like opportunities to have online learning so you just really don't have to pay much um and that way yeah that way you you won't have to worry about taking out loans and stuff. Um, to me, that that seems like a pretty pretty good way to do it. Um, let's see. Just learning. Yeah, I think that way, like literally, like they've been doing with COVID, you can well, actually you could literally just do the same thing instead of having to go to class and pay a teacher to do the class. You could just watch an old video of the teacher that did the class a couple of years ago, and that way you don't have to pay that teacher to do the class again this time around. Um, see what i mean uh and in any case I, I think like in any case the prices of like colleges have are are way more than the actual price that it takes to, to teach a person it's got largely to do with having to fund like uh, research within the, the institution um so what you'd have to do is decouple the research so you'd say that universities can only charge an amount uh that corresponds to you know the actual cost of uh of like education or or no because you, you've got these colleges the, the point, I guess, no, the, the point is that you should just, you just, I don't know. No, I guess not. Cause some, some, some institutions don't really do any research. So really you could just get a degree from an institution that doesn't like do any research. Quality unless you use bioweapons to make everyone take online learning as you are explaining. <laughs> no, no, no. My point is that just, if you want something cheaper, if you want a cheaper degree, uh, you could just have an, on, you could just like have an online learning. But the point is that, 
you just have it be recognized. Like you just accept that online learning degrees, like and not completely online, but just have more online stuff so that you don't have to, so to make it cheaper. So you just have institutions that do more of this stuff online so that it's cheaper. Uh, and you have that be recognized federally so that then you can have a proper degree. Used to strengthen the worldwide police state? No, no, it's not. Um, uh, I do, I, at this point, I do think it was an escape from the Wuhan lab. And I, and we know that Fauci was linked to it. And I think that's why Fauci was quick to dismiss it. So yeah, so that, yeah. So that kind of, you know, theorizing, I think is correct. I don't think it was intentional. I, and I don't think it was used to strengthen the worldwide police state. Um, I don't think that. Uh, let's see. So anti-ISIS. So so successful. And that was good. It's true. So the Obama administration launched an international coalition to destroy the redoubt of the Islamic State in August 2014. The anti-ISIS campaign scored victory after victory in 2015 and 2016. ISIS lost control of its last oil field in October 2016, destroying its economic basis. So that was under Obama. That same month, coalition forces launched an offensive to retake Mosul, the last Iraqi city in ISIS hands, as well as a symbolically important stir town of the big. No, I just, I do it because it's, I miss you. <laughs> um, <laughs> why? No. <laughs> um, and wh why would I lie? Like, like why would I lie? <laughs> the, the last, uh, so Trump continued the anti-ISIS campaign in 2017 and 2018 and it remained successful, culminating in a U.S. raid that killed the ISIS commander Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in October 2019. ISIS survives an inspiration for terror attacks, but the Obama-Trump operation put an end to ISIS's attempts to found a territorial state and destroy its conventional military forces. Okay, that's true. So he kept on doing the good work that Obama already did uh, regarding that. Speeding generic drug approval. In 2016, the Food and Drug Administration approved 73 new generic med medications. That figure rose year by year through the Trump administration, reaching 107 in 2019. Of Hippo figured this out 2,000 years ago during a similar collapse of the Roman Empire. Augustine regretted not paying his teachers more. I regret not paying my teachers more. I guess it felt like such a mandated alien system I didn't understand. What do you mean not paying your teacher? Why do you regret not paying your teachers more? In, in what way do you regret like not paying your teachers more? Um, but like, I would say that pe teachers are just paid more or less like what they deserve to be. No, I, I, I would say that teachers is one of the jobs where they're like, yeah, they're neither over nor underpaid, uh, in my opinion. Um, although I, I probably because I had better teachers as a kid that could be allowed to exist now. Then I guess you mean, uh, okay. Well, the point is that that if they're less good teachers now, it's maybe because they're less. There's less funding to education, uh, and again, I I do support then funding for, yes. yeah, I do support funding for, for like education for kids. I think that ki education for kids up to high school should be paid for by the government, but not um, not uh, tertiary education, not not university. Uh, but the government should recognize degrees from universities that are cheap by doing things such as like by not having any research and by not having um, uh, yeah kind of kind of yep um like it, it should be the, like um yeah college should not be funded by the government in my opinion but the government should recognize degrees from colleges that uh, you know, are are cheap because they the like have lots of online part stuff. Of teaching children is the really important part. Well, also that, yeah, but also that, but the, to for a teacher to be able to be good in an immaterial way, they you need resources to to train them, right? Um, and, you know, so that is still it's still material in that sense. Um, but also, yeah, you just need to create a culture that that makes teachers be be somehow more have more wisdom i suppose and, and more and more competence which is not oh, it's not just money it's not just money that's true uh so let's see so that same year congress passed new legislation that will bring more generics to market even faster in the future the creates act will allow generic drug makers to sue drug developers that withhold information needed to manufacture generics in a timely way once patent protection expires okay Pharmaceutical companies did heroic work in 2020 by bringing coronavirus vaccines to market fast, but predatory pricing has shattered the industry for many years. Faster approval of generics is only a step towards a solution, but a step it is, so kudos for that. Yeah, again, good stuff here. Tightening asylum rules. 
So in as much as you like Trump because of, like of that, then that that is good. You know, this is why I'm saying you're not like he didn't do everything bad. It's true. In the Wikipedia article, it only mentions the bad, basically. And, and this is sort of what uh, my issue with the Wikipedia article. And like if you if you see Spider-Man again, you can tell him this that like, you know, if you like Trump because of this, if you like Trump also just because he's anti-identity politics, then that that then you're not a bad person. Okay. This, my point is if you actually support little kids getting separated permanently from their families, that is bad. Okay. Um, let's see. And, and he didn't support that anyway. But my, my point is that if you just support everything that Trump did, that is wrong. Uh, and also like the environmental stuff, he, he, you know, if you support that kind of stuff, that's wrong. Um, in the 21st century, asylum seeking has expanded, expanded dramatically. If asylum seekers can set foot in the U.S., they gain residency and work rights pending the slow adjudication of their asylum claims. A system of rules written to protect people fleeing state persecution now enables people to migrate by citing spousal abuse or gang violence in their country of origin. Okay, but they're saying this is a good thing that to tie an asylum rules, and I, I don't. In mid-2020, the Trump administration revised the asylum rules to return them to the original purpose. Asylum seekers who spent more than two weeks in any country en route to the United States will have to file their claim in that country. Fear of crime will no longer be deemed persecution for asylum purposes. Claims being frivolous can be closed. These, but yeah, it's sort of, yeah, if it's just like a bit of crime or spousal abuse, I agree that it's not, it doesn't qualify for asylum. My point is I just don't support borders. So I can't, I can't actually consider this a good policy. I cannot consider this a good policy. These changes go into effect in January 2021. They have upset many in the asylum advocacy community. They may also save the Biden administration from a migration surge as COVID-19 abates, protecting it from another of those summertime rushes to the border that did so much damage to the Obama administration politically in 2014 and 2016. Okay, but those actually... We're seeing that Biden actually has seen a surge. Um, nearly doubling the standard tax deduction. Uh, again, I don't see that as a good thing. So this was written by still a pretty, like, s s relatively, again, notice this is a relatively right-wing perspective at this point. The 2017 tax bill failed to deliver an investment boom, but it did lighten the tax load of many low-income earners, as well as simplify their life. Before the tax bill, the standard deduction for taxpayers was 6350 for single people, 9350 for heads of household, and 12700 for married couples. There was also a personal exemption of 4050 Beyond that protected amount, low-income taxpayers could deduct additional amounts if they kept proper records. The tax law stepped away that need for record-keeping by lower-wage workers, and it nearly doubled the standard tax deduction. For income earned in 2020, single people pay no income tax in, on their first 12400 heads of household on their first 18650 and married couples on their first 24800 While most of the benefits of the 27 p 2017 bill were collected by the richest, this measure, this measure did a real service not only to the working poor, but to many mingled income families who can deduct more while reporting less. Okay, so that that is that is true. That is good. So maybe he's not all that right when either. Um, let's see. Restoring due process on campus. In 2011, the Obama administration issued new guidance to universities to guard against sexual harassment and sexual abuse. So horrifying in terms of judges being presented <laughs> with having to decide whether or not to separate parents and children. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Many universities interpreted, but I don't really know the problems. I don't really know how you could, you could do it differently. Basically, this is kind of the the issue. Um. Anyway, many universities interpreted this guidance. This is why I'm not really commenting much on it because I, I don't like I don't really know how to do it differently. Many universities interpreted this guidance as a command to do away with due process protections in sexual assault cases. Okay, many accused students lost such basis. Wait, many accused students lost such basic rights as knowing the charges against them. Universities often saved money by appointing the same official to investigate accusations, accusations, determine guilt, and apply punishment. Emily Yoff reported for The Atlantic in 2017 on the extreme unfairness universities often inflicted after the 2011 guidance. So this, this is where there's the weird sort of lefty identity politics stuff that comes into play. But in, I, I would say in comparison, it's comparison to the bad stuff that Trump did, it's still relatively minor. But I agree this, that that is, that is a problem with the weird sort of leftiness. And, and in as much as he fought against that, that was a good thing. Um, um, Let's see. Courts agreed. Students were were soon filing and wooden lawsuits against universities for denying their due process rights. By one scholar's count, about 100 cases a year by decade's end. The Trump Education Department has rescinded the 2011 guidance and reaffirmed that sexual misconduct accusations on campus must be campus must be dealt with using the same due process rules that apply everywhere else in American society. That is good. Space Force. 
Okay, so at the start of the nuclear era, U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force each demand its own nuclear force. The resulting triplication not only wasted money, but nearly toppled the world into ca catastrophe. The Army's nuclear cap the Army's nuclear ambitions saddled the U.S. with thousands of short-range nuclear weapons that invited war planners to imagine Army's a battlefield world for Hiroshima-style warheads. Weird or bad. And you want to reword that cause you deaf misspoke. No, I didn't. It is it is weird. I don't I don't support it. it it's racist. It's racialist. And if it's racialist, it's in practice is racist. The Air Force sustained its strategic bomber force for decades after it was rendered obsolete by intercontinental missiles. Um, the balance between it land racist? because it because it basically says that like you you you're a sort of um you you're culture is determined by your race so it basically expects you to act in a certain way uh, according to your race and it subjects you to different rules depending on your race it's literally saying if you belong to this race then i'm going to treat you like this and if you belong to the other race it's Do you even like that know what CRT is? yeah and it's it's kind of racist Crimps underscore underscore what is leftist to you what is identity politics this this is this stuff is is racist and it is racist like literally if you say like, oh, if you're black, you're allowed to wear dreadlocks, but then if you're white, you're not. You know, this you that is that is racist. Is. That is racist. Um, CRT is simply basically about saying that. Tell me definition. I don't even care if I get it wrong. It doesn't matter. The point is that I know what the people who believe in CRT believe in, and the idea is that it's about saying that you even if there's not any. This intentionally discriminatory policies if there is an inequality of outcome between racism then that between races then that counts as systemic racism and i completely disagree i think that's that's a complete misuse of words and it's that is not systemic racism um if, if you've got just unequal outcomes between races that is not systemic racism and sis clearly and cr apologist. no you're clearly the racist apologist here you're the, the racist person you are the racist person here this is what I'm saying. This is exactly what I've been I've been saying. Um, this is probably also why I'm struggling to gain new viewers because most people are either right wing or left wing, and so the litmus test to be right wing is like to support things like like national borders and support like income inequality. You are and so condescending and narcissistic. It's unreal. Oh, as if you aren't right. <laughs> uh, and. Like, and literally, and then the leftists, like the litmus test is to like support CRT and stuff. And this is, and, and it's both absurd. And like, literally it's so silly because if you drop CRT, then you could get, you'd suddenly like eliminate this whole polarization. Cause suddenly you'd see uh, a vast swaths of the population probably uh, being able to now recognize that, um, that uh, like the Republican party is bad since they won't have anything to just trying to maximally hurt you don't engage wait is this oh yeah it's oh it's a new account oh this is just a person who's come to to like troll me presumably except oh it was created an hour ago so presumably it wasn't quite created to well whatever enjoy your day but why did you just it's sort of weird how there's so many people who come here are people who just created goodbye. the account uh yeah goodbye okay so at least this is not maybe a troll um so again, this is a problem. This is a problem. You get all these crazy lefties and crimps underscore underscore live better if you can. You get all these crazy lefties who like you know want to continue doing this stuff. Again, um tell Peter Parker, you know, tell him about this exchange. Um could be a bot. Mm, no, no, it's not. No. No, if you if you look at no, if you no you look at he he responded to everything I said like bots uh, bots uh no uh, there's too much intelligence there to be a bot. Um, let's see to satisfy the nuclear ambitions of the three services. It's weird how these services themselves like want to have more bombs. <laughs> like the U.S. built too many warheads, risking the health of workers at nuclear facilities and creating a dangerous disposal problem once the Cold War ended. In retrospect, the country would have better to create this. Force, the Air Force, Army, Marines, Marines, and Navy continue their conventional combat off. rules. Maybe even persuadable. Uh, yeah, at Green some point. Yeah. Anyone? yeah, at some point, yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I believe in this super smart artificial intelligence called the Gorth, right? And so that is much more much more convincing than any human, in fact. Uh, like, literally, humans would fail the Turing test 
and this thing would would win it. Uh, so the insights used to lead the Department of Defense to create a new space force for national security operations above the atmosphere. Trump's childish enthusi- Trump's childish enthusiasm for a deadly new toy has tended to discredit what seems like a good new idea. Okay. Uh, let's see. Criminal justice reform. Of the 2.1 million incarcerated... Any of those East Coast revelations of early nuclear leaks that came out a few years ago? Fourth. Uh, I'm not sure about and the... the, the asterisk. And those... Okay, I don't even know about that, actually. Uh, Gore, yeah, okay, so you haven't heard that. You're probably going to think I'm nuts. I, I believe in that. I believe that there's a sort of other dimension to the universe and that the, in this thing, some people a long time ago created a, a, an evil AI that is able to like influence our, our minds. Um, I know I, I know it sounds kooky, but anyway, um, th- so that's my my sort of pet belief. Um, so anyway, um, let's see. Evil AI. Yeah. Gnosticism. Yeah. Ca- yeah. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. Um, of the 2.1 million incarcerated people in the United States, fewer than 10% are held in the federal prison system. Yet federal prisons play a disproportionately large role in prison policy. They set trends that states follow and suggest standards for states to emulate. The Trump administration's first step prison reform proposals were cautious but humane. Mandatory minimum sentences will be reduced for certain drug offenses. Prisoners, but at the same time, apparently the administration sought to like seek maximum uh, conviction and maximum sentencing. Prisoners will more easily qualify for early release and be closer to their home. Women in prison will also receive sanitary products free of cost, helping to end the economic exploitation of prisoners who are often overcharged for basic necessities. Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. The most important benefit of the First Step program is that it offers political cover to states to embark on their own reforms. If the supposedly tough-on-crime Trump administration can endorse lighter sentences and free tampons, so can conservative state politicians. Yeah, I agree. Okay, civic participation. The United States has historically been characterized by lower levels of political participation than other advanced democracies. Trump fixed that. Throughout 2020, he made clear his determination to hold on to power unless repudiated by a massive popular margin. He had won the presidency in 2016 despite losing the national popular vote by nearly 3 million ballots. Plainly, an even bigger margin would be required to force him out. The anti-Trump majority of the electorate absorbed that message and acted on it. Never in U.S. history has such a high proportion of the adult population cast ballot. Nearly two-thirds of eligible voters, 66.2%, turned out in 2020. The last year to come close was 1908, when 65.7% of those eligible voted. But in 1908, women were not eligible to vote. Men qualified to vote at age 21 rather than age 18. And in much of the country, black people were effectively ineligible too. The 66% of 1908 was achieved when a U.S. population of 88.7 million cast 14.9 million votes. The 66% of 2020 was achieved by a population of 331 million casting 158 million votes. A president who sought to subvert U.S. democracy instead inspired unprecedented numbers of Americans to participate in that democracy in order to save it from him. This was an achievement Donald Trump did not intend and surely did not want, but it was his achievement, even so. This this is kind of the point: is that half of his achievements were not like his, and like much of like criminal justice reform, presumably it was more just that something needed to be done, and they ended up doing something, just um, like it would have happened. Anyway, even if it wasn't Trump. Um, so, so there we go. There we go. Let's see. Um, okay, so. Let's see. What, what, is this, what does this article say? Trump didn't repeal about Obamacare. He accidentally bolstered it. <laughs> Trump came into office, vowing to repeal Obamacare, and even took the law to court when, it failed, when that failed in Congress. But his most significant imprint on the Affordable Care Act was an accidental boost that happened when he stumbled into pouring billions of extra federal dollars into subsidizing Americans' coverage. The move. House Republicans had tried for years to cut off subsidies that help low-income Obamacare and release with the co-pays, co-insurance, and deductibles that come with their health plans. In 2017, Trump finally did it through administrative means that after the GOP effort to replace the law fell apart. And he immediately drew intense outcry from Democrats and policy experts who called the move sabotage. 
The impact. The health exchange is going collapse as Trump had hoped. Wait, why, why not? Instead, health plans and state quickly figured out a way to claw back the federal dollars they lost. Would be nice if Joe Biden would make a bold declaration of equity by promising that all of us would get the same treatment as mm -hmm. his son, Hunter. Yeah. Can violate drug laws, gun laws. Yeah. Get five hundred thousand dollars for artwork that's just a random mess. <laughs> Wait, that wouldn't be sustainable. Yeah, well, of course, they, there's that. That I mean, again, Biden is not perfect, right? I'm just saying that overall, his policies were. They should be better. They're like, yeah, th there is this issue with like Hunter and stuff, but like, um, let's see. It's not like, but it's not like, it's not like Trump, it's not like Trump didn't have his own sort of cronyism. Um, but, but yeah, of course, and I, like I say, I'm critical of Biden in many respects. So, yeah. Um, let's see. They built the cost of the subsidies into premiums for Obamacare benchmark silver policies okay this meant that the premiums for the silver plan spiked as a result the premium subsidies the government had to pay for low income in release vastly increased okay the concept known as silver loading grew government subsidizing of the exchanges by upwards of 20 billion dollars per year the upshot while trump's moves made obamacare plans increasingly unaffordable for the unsubsidized democrats quickly tamped down their criticism since it accomplished their goal of significantly boosting funding for obamacare the incoming Biden administration isn't likely to reverse, of course. Okay. But again, it still it still was a bad intent. Um, strategy. Trump refocused national security on greater power competition. Okay. Defense policy documents are so abundant that they could paper the Pentagon. But the Trump administration's national defense strategy stands out as one of the most important defense policy shifts of the last generation, reorienting the American military to confront rising and increasingly aggressive powers Russia and China. Okay, the move. The 2018 strategy rewired the Defense Department's vast bureaucracy away from focus on finding insurgents and terrorists in the Middle East towards the long-term strategic competition with China and Russia. As a result, the military is changing how it trains personnel, which technologies it buys, and the geographic areas of the world where it prioritizes its forces. The impact already has led to reordering of the Pentagon budget and new investments supported by a bipartisan majority in Congress including billions of dollars to beef up the U.S. military presence in the Asia-Pacific. The upshot, despite differences in tone and rhetoric, this is refocusing of the United States military posture that is expected to continue in the Biden administration. Again, I don't like this. This is like nationalism, national geopolitics and stuff. I don't like that. Um, but I agree that in practice, like pragmatically, as long as you're doing that, you kind of have to. But I, I still don't. What you should be doing is aiming to um, de-escalate and to just make to to just fight against any nationalism from, from any side. Uh, so I, I really don't agree with that. Coronavirus, Trump failed to provide workplace guidance, making safety harder for workers. Um, okay, so anyway, so we know kind of about this. So well, let's just read it anyway. Arguably the most consequential decision Trump made involving American workers, I'm something it chose not to do. For this either. Like I said, I'll take you over the Atlantic. It declined to implement. You make Politico sound better by running it through your mind between seeing it and saying it. Um. Okay. Wait. So wait. So I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'll take you over the Atlantic, and you make Politico sound better. Um. So sorry. I, I guess you're actually this. You're making a compliment to me, saying that I I provide an interpretation, which then allows you to sort of, um, you know, make yeah. So I, presumably you're saying this as a, as a good thing. Um, like, anyway, uh, it declined to implement a so-called emergency temporary standard when the coronavirus pandemic hit. Such a standard issued when the Occupational Safety I and Health Administration... Of you like. Okay, yeah, you yeah. Good thing. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, but you should be suspicious of Politico and the Atlantic. You should, of course. Such a standard issued when the Occupational Safety and Health Administration determines workers are in grave danger would have established immediate and mandatory workplace safety rules employers must follow to protect employees from exposure. Um, the move, despite pressure from Democrats, unions, and worker advocates, OSHA refused to set rules for worker safety during the pandemic. Republicans defended the decision by saying the burden on companies struggling to stay afloat amid the recession would be too great. In the absence of a standard, employers have to 
have only had to comply with a mix of optional guidelines able to pick and choose what precautions they take. The impact. The agency's backseat approach to workplace safety means Americans still face a dangerously unpredictable range of safety conditions when they show up to work. <laughs> Though OSHA has cited some companies for coronavirus related to the transgressions, many large corporations received meager fines even in cases when workers died from COVID-19. Democrats have attempted to include language mandating an emergency temporary standard in future rounds of pandemic aid, but their efforts have been unsuccessful. Um... Let's actually make this bigger. The upshot. One of the first things the Biden administration will likely move to do is instruct OSHA to step up worker safety enforcement, including by enacting an emergency standard and ramping up penalties on volunteers. Biden's campaign also pledged to double the number of OSHA in investigators to enforce the law and existing standards. Okay, but wait, I don't I don't understand. How how is this a good wait? Oh, this is not saying the good things. This is just saying these things that had an impact, right? Okay, 30 things he did they might have missed, so not not just bad things, but like not just good things, but also bad things. Religion and schools. Trump boosted religious organizations and education. Okay, that's that's a bad thing. Okay, so now I understand. So they're not they're not just saying it's a good thing. Okay. So Trump failed to enact any sweeping school choice policy that sends money to parents to help them pay for private and religious schools, thankfully. But his administration, led by Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, a devout Christian, found ways to expand federal support for religious schools and organizations at the education department. See, I, I disagree. I think this should be absolutely I think a religious school should be illegal. I, I don't. I think it should be f f forbidden. Um, again, because children, I, I don't think parents should have uh, that much authority over their children. I think that that's propagandizing, and I think religious schools are largely responsible for, uh, you know, are one of the responsible reasons why people are are so crazy in the United States. Um, I, I would make I would make um, ma make mandatory mandatory um, uh, state education for everyone mandatory free public state education for everyone except for uh like children who have like problems or like you know like get bullied or something and they just can't you know they can't function but otherwise i think yeah the move devos tweaked a wide range of federal education policies large and small to bolster faith-based organizations Internet feudal lords are literally taking joy rides up into orbit and richer than ever when half or more of small businesses yeah. have been destroyed okay you did it. What do you mean? Okay, you did it. Uh, she changed regulations, for example, to make it easier for members of religious orders to access federal financial aid and expenses fed expanded federal public service loan forgiveness to cover clergy members. And she created new protections for faith-based campus organizations at public universities. Um, at the K-12 education level, DeVos stopped enforcing a policy that had prohibited, it, prohibited religious organizations from providing publicly funded services such as tutoring, technology, and counseling in private schools. And she opened up federal grants for charter schools to religiously affiliated organizations. Again, I, I, I do not support any of that. Many The move, many religious education groups praised DeVos changes, which she often described as an effort to expand religious liberty. Too many misinterpret the separation of church and state as an invitation for government to separate people from their faith, she said. But yet yeah, children should be separated from faith. You should be free to go to 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 church, but not uh, schools. They should, shouldn't be uh, not in school. That, that shouldn't be a, a school thing. The Biden administration is expected to move quickly to roll back many of DeVos's education policies, but it's not yet clear how the incoming administration will approach her various policy tweaks to promote religious organizations. Okay, oversight. Trump's interior department sent a new standard for ignoring Congress. Okay, Trump's interior department sent a president that, while may have escaped notice outside Washington, D.C., is almost certain to be influential going forward. It's stonewalled, it's stonewalled congressional oversight and got away with it. The move. Interior Secretary David Bernhard showed up for congressional hearings that decide the fate of the department's budget, but otherwise refused invitations from the House National Resources Committee to defend this policy actions under Trump. The attitude flowed down to sub-agency heads as well. Scott Angel, the administration's head of the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the office in charge of setting offshore drilling and safety standards, told the committee he was too busy to answer the committee's request that he explain his practice of handing out waivers on regulation to put in place in response to Deepwater Horizon rig disaster. The impact, the foot drag in, pro in providing even basic information stretched to winning requests from Congress and the public. House Democrats complained that Interior, in responding to winning re questions, would flood the zone with thousands of documents that had little relation to the topic at hand and even include pages containing nothing but wingdings from. Interior was also sued by outside groups and subject to an internal watchdog audit over complaints of slow walking public information requests. The upshot, all, all in all, the agency got away with it. Democrats complained but never followed through on a subpoena threat. By the final months of the Trump administration, Interra official complained completely stopped attending House hearings meant to flag issues with the department. The behavior all but guarantees that future administrations will follow suit. Okay. All right. Cannabis. 
and school choice and diverse school <coughs> options is pretty much the most important right I've ever wanted to have. I grew up wanting to become a school designer but gradually saw schools become so corrupt I witnessed professors, in 2011 to 12, begging students to write down right answers so they'd make quota. Well, the problem is that school, that children never school choose their schools, right? Um, which means that, like, children don't school choose their schools, which means that it's just parents. Didn't care, laughed, and wouldn't make the cheating marks the professors wanted. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, like, yeah. Okay. But th my my point is that you don't like ch it's children the parents don't choose their schools. Yet I feel that. Yeah, and, and this is this is my objection to school choice. If it was adults choosing where to go to school for themselves, then yeah. But the problem is that that's not how it works. And so instead, children just get sent to whatever school by their parents. And and that is why I don't really support school choice. Um, I, I would support it like for, for, of course, for higher education, of course, uh, for higher education. Sure. Um, I've been thinking it's also high school. I'm thinking maybe like children, you know, once they're teenagers, they might be able to choose like the, you know, to go to a particular school. I think that would uh, make sense. Um, but like for elementary school, no. For elementary school, I I I think everybody should just have public uh public education, um and we should increase funding to make public education better, um, but I I think that's that's really otherwise you'll just have these sort of separate, you know I I think it's good to have everybody sort of together in the same in the same sort of thing, um, that that's that's what I support homeschooling only if there's like a good reason to to homeschool. Uh, I, I could I can acknowledge that for some kids that there's there's a need for homeschooling, and, and basically private schools uh, no like I'm I'm basically anti private schools I'm just in favor of making really good, really good public schools, um, through so so funding public schools so so that it can be much better and they just like make it basically make it mandatory and then having to like ask for an exception you know if if you want to have an exception. I think that is totalitarianism. Yeah, but diversity, it doesn't matter because the children are still just getting forced whatever the parents want. That is totalitarianism. The governments, at least they did, you know, you're just getting everything. That's equality of opportunity, right? If uh, if kids can all go to the same school, they have equality of opportunity. If they don't, then that's not equality of opportunity. And they also end up being sent to weird, like, religious schools that will teach them w weird stuff. Uh, that, again, parents... Pa Parent, parents shouldn't have the, this authority to brainwash their kids uh, excessively. They, there should be a counterbalancing force uh, through through public school. Um, so, wait, cannabis legalization advocates were alarmed when Trump picked Jeff Sessions as his first attorney general. For marijuana supporters, Sessions' anti-cannabis rhetoric harkened, down back, harkened back to reefer madness days, and they feared he would crack down the burgeoning state-regulated marijuana industry. Their fears were founded in January 2018. Sessions rescinded the Cole Memo Memo, an Obama-era Justice Department guidance that called for deprior deprioritizing marijuana enforcement. The memo had provided some protection for state legal marijuana markets and informed how state governments set up their own cannabis laws. But a sessions led crackdown never materialized. The move, despite its anti wood rhetoric, the Trump administration sh stood to the side as 18 states liberalized their marijuana laws from 2016 to 2020 including staunchly conservative states like Mississippi and South Dakota. Despite former Attorney General William Barr's antitrust scrutiny of cannabis deals, the federal government remained relatively hands-off on marijuana policy. The impact cannabis is now legal in some form in 36 states, meaning that a majority of Americans have some form of legal access, even though the drug remains officially legal at the federal level. In fact, more than one-third of Americans now live in states with full legalization. Governments shouldn't have the authority to laugh at their subjects and say they ought to be able to disarm them because small arms are nothing compared to nuclear weapons and air fleets. I, I actually don't understand. I think they should be able to, like, do you, do you think private citizens should be able to own nuclear weapons? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think... Similarly, let people have children. I don't, I don't understand the argument there. I don't understand the argument. Try to foster them. People. Try to... I, I still don't understand. <laughs> what? Sorry, <laughs> no, I'm not getting it. Specific input from specific people. Still don't get it. Uh, okay, so become a massive business. Um, loan forgiveness, Trump curb relief for defrauded students. 
Okay, Trump dismantled Obama-era policies that were designed to curb abuses by for-profit colleges, including rules designed to make it easier for borrowers to obtain loan forgiveness if they were cheated or duped by their college. Okay. And so Betsy DeVos said, so Education Secretary Betsy DeVos said the Obama administration's approach was too lenient, akin to allowing borrowers to access free money at taxpayer expense. Um, okay. The move. DeVos rewrote the Obama administration's rules that govern when federal student loan borrowers can have their debt wiped out as a result of their college's misconduct, imposing stricter standards of proof. She also required the Education Department to provide only partial loan relief in many cases, a departure from the Obama administration's policy of providing full loan forgiveness. Congress moved to block the rules with 10 GOP senators jo joining Democrats, but Trump vetoed the legislation and the new rules took effect. The impact. Borrowers seeking to have their loans wiped out because of the misconduct of their college, such as misleading or deceiving students about their job prospects, will have a tougher time proving their claims. The Education Department estimates that, estimates that the Trump policy will reduce federal loan forgiveness by hundreds of millions of dollars each year. The upshot Biden has already committed to swiftly reversing Trump's changes to the rules, which are known as borrower defense to repayment. But he's facing pressure from progressives to go further and provide sweeping debt cancellations to all borrowers, regardless of whether they're defrauded. So I just don't necessarily, I don't really know what to think, because I don't think, I think you should have to pay for college. Um, I just don't think it should be so expensive. And if it is so expensive, I think it's because uh, they're using a system, which is like, currently, most learning could just be done online, online and could be just incredibly cheap. So what I want is, a rec yeah, I think... Basically, the problem is that we had a system which made it too expensive. So what you should do is, you should you should pr probably um, you should probably refund some of these these loans, forgive some amount of the loans, and then on the other hand, um, then what you do is is you allow for you know lots of institutions to provide uh, online online degrees. Shell companies. Trump made it easier to prosecute financial crimes like money laundering. Uh, okay, see that that's the problem with the Wikipedia article is that only mentioned the bad stuff. So the Trump administration played a major but little noticed role. Should be allowed to exist. After all, culturing people in a diverse manner is more often beneficial and less often deleterious than the very new idea of trying to culture up pandemic-capable viruses in vitro. Uh. Again, a bit weird. I'm not really, not really sure what to what to say about that. Um, so apparently they they've done this this legislation to, to so the new law requires millions of business entities to report their true owners, puncturing the veil of anonymity that shell companies give to money launderers and tax evaders, and make it easier for prosecutors to literally follow the money. Okay, so this is good. Uh, the information businesses report to the Treasury Department would be accessible to law enforcement agencies that would have an unprecedented tool to investigate shell companies. Banks, which are responsible for policing criminal activity by their customers, would also be able to tap into the database. Um, so, good. Poverty. Trump, Trump shrank the food safety net a lot. Okay, bad thing here. Under Trump, the Agriculture Department scaled back the $60 billion dollars. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the Food Support Program for Low-Income Americans, formerly known as food stamps. Um, the administration said it wanted to cut back on waste and save money. This program. Idea of banning private schools. Yeah, but I, 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 I think I, I completely support it. I don't support, like, again, why should parents then be able to, to send kids to be brainwashed into whatever way they think they should be brainwashed? I, I don't think it's good. And again, it's. It's not fair to the kids. You know about the ban on that in it's Oregon not. in 1922. I did not. Uh, we can look at that also. Um, in 2018, the Agriculture Department issued, introduced a new rule that aimed to more strictly enforce certain work mandates under the program, make it more difficult for states to seek waivers from SNAP work requirements, body to adult care for children and other dependents. Okay, so um, that that seems suspicious, but may, like maybe, but... The KKK in Oregon got it that passed, really? Um, in any case, it, that is no, it's it's actually parent parental authoritarianism um that that you're fighting against by making all kids go to public school. Um Babe Ruth traveled to Washington to campaign against the follow-on attempt. Yeah. Washington okay. State. Okay, a judge halted the rule. Okay, Washington State. 
overtime pay, millions of workers lost access to extra pay for long hours. Okay. The federal government rolled out a series of employer-friendly rules and decisions, many of which slid under the national radar. One of the most significant, his labor department finalized an overtime rule notably weaker than that issued under Obama, leaving millions of workers ineligible. In 2016, Obama's labor department finalized a rule that would raise the salary threshold for overtime eligibility from around 24000 to some 47000 a year with trinal increases. Okay, at the time, only about 6% of workers were eligible. But Trump's White House declined to defend the rule in court and in 2019 proposed its own much more lax rule, which would raise the threshold to about 35000 with no schedule raises. Um, okay. The impact. The Trump rule applies to just 15% of full-time salaried workers, whereas the Obama rule would, have, rule would have applied to twice as many. That's at least 8 million workers who would have been elig eligible for overtime pay under the 2016 version and are now ineligible. Some estimates place the amount of wages lost at around $1 billion annually. Okay, the upshot. Biden's role in the Obama administration, which proposed the original rule, and his sweeping pro-worker agenda indicate that he will likely overturn the Trump rule and issue his own overtime rule, though when exactly that will happen remains unclear. Uh, greenhouse gas and gas emissions. So we know that what he did there on and gas emissions. We already looked at that. Um, drones near ban on government use of Chinese drones. Okay, that seems not bad. So let's let's go quickly through this. Made it possible to follow the Pentagon's money. Okay, so that sounds actually good. Um, uh, so he actually had a, a good thing for that. Boost the economy with taxes that didn't pay political dividends. Um, yeah. The impact. So. Yeah. Robocalls track down mostly successfully on unwanted calls and text. Um, apparently, there's a bunch of unwanted automated phone calls. So, yeah, okay, so he, he did that, so that's good. Exile climate scientists from from Washington, literally, so we, we know this. Um, yeah. Trump took a big swing at finally fixing healthcare technology. Um, yeah, so... So... We're yeah. We're some corrupt government that you don't trust either to become so powerful it can abduct as many children, hopefully all of them, as possible, and teach them the same things. <laughs> when there are so many different things that different people need to know and that no one person can ever learn, so that they can be as similar as possible, is not even nearly the most totalitarian thing I can imagine, but I'm haunted. <laughs> Look, you're, you're seeing it as a totalitarian thing. I, I don't. I, I really don't. Because um, the whole point is, again, is that kids don't choose. Kids, so it's not, in any cases, it's still more fair for the kids. It's still more fair for the kids. Um, but yeah, look, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah, I mean, for now, we've got like private schools and pretty much everywhere, and and you know, it's okay too, but. I personally prefer to have everybody at, at, in state school. Um, Kids and adults should have more choice than the ruling apparatus. The ruling apparatus should answer to adults and kids. Yeah, but the whole point, I mean, yeah, but kids, kids. I know there have been horrible schools. I think kids shouldn't really be allowed to to choose. I mean. But once you're a teenager, yeah, more. But um, memory makes you fear. What memory makes you fear? If you want to share. I don't understand. Um. So wait, what do you do? Oh yeah, he did his stupid. He ending curbs on auto emissions. That that was really dumb. So he did this again. Um. Yeah, he said Obama wants to increase five percent. Trump one point five percent only. Um, and so that, that was really stupid. Like Trump, Trump was really dumb. Um, th this was, this was really dumb. Either from your schooling or someone. The anti-monopolist started winning despite Trump at first, then with his help. Um, for the past decades, politicians on both sides of the aisle have expressed concerns about the growing size, power and influence of tech giants. 
who really took actions against them. Progressive anti-monopoly advocates were largely overruled during the Obama years at the two U.S. at the U.S.'s two antitrust agencies, the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department. But amid growing conservative anger at the tech giants, Trump's regulators regulators eventually joined the fight and dusted off an antitrust legal playbook that had been used since the breakup of AT&T in the 1980s. Okay. Early on, Trump's tenure seemed to be following recent patterns by waving through major mergers like the combination of telecom giant Sprint and T-Mobile. But two Trump picks, FTC Chair Joe Simmons and DOJ's Barr, have spent the past two years more aggressively looking into antitrust concerns raised by Silicon Valley. In recent months, the DOJ filed a landmark antitrust case against Google, its biggest monopolization case since the 1990s suit against Microsoft. The FTC, meanwhile, is pursuing its own watershed suit against Facebook that can see this... That could see the social network broken up. The impact is too soon to tell whether the antitrust actions will succeed in forcing changes at Google or Facebook, but they have sent a signal that there will be more scrutiny of their business practices going forward. Both lawyers will, both lawsuits will continue into the Biden administration and possibly beyond. Or was such a stereotypical CIA con? Uh, yeah, I I don't really know enough about him to to be able to comment. So, yeah, yeah. A big crackdown on legal immigrants. <laughs> he talked so well. So yeah, he wanted to to limit. He wanted to limit uh, restrictions. Um, ideas he never acted upon. Hmm. <laughs> like I I I don't even, I'm not even really interested in this because I'm just anti border I'm just anti countries. You know. So so yeah. Trump impeded regulation even though Republicans wanted it on toxic chemicals. Trump's EPA essentially blew up a bipartisan deal to more strictly regulate toxic chemicals than Americans that Americans are exposed to daily, and instead tapped a group of chemicals industry experts to run and advise the program. Um, the 2016 overhaul of the Toxic Substances Control Act, supported by do both Democrats and Republicans, had given EPA new teeth to go after well-known dangerous chemicals like asbestos and methylene chloride in a bid to boost public confidence in the safety of consumer products. The move, Trump officials muzzled scientists and civil servants at the agency and crafted narrow approaches to assessing chemicals dangers that have massive loopholes. So this, again, this is why Trump is really bad. Specifically, while under the new law, Congress urged EPA to consider all possible exposures to chemicals, chemical cumulatively, whether in the water, air, through, ex through consumer uses or exposure at work. Um, I disagree with the vaccination. But, oh, really? Um, well, that, okay, but you call yourself Flat Earth Bill, so, okay, that's not surprising. Um, so, but Trump's EPA opted only to look at risk from exposures that couldn't be regulated under other laws. For instance, they wouldn't weigh potential exposure to a chemical in drinking water since it could be regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, even if it wasn't. Trump's EPA also mostly whiffed statutory deadlines to finish studying risk for most for the first round of chemicals under the 2016 law and was slapped by federal court for ignoring certain ways Americans are exposed to toxins. The impact, the administration approach paves the way for less stringent regulation of toxic chemicals. If the Biden EPA leaves the laxer evaluations intact, its subsequent regulations will not be able to limit certain ways people are exposed, meaning Americans may not get comprehensive protections. While it is likely the Biden administration will take a more holistic look at future chemicals EPA reviews, it is unclear whether it will have time to reanalyze the chemicals the Trump administration already finished reviewing. Biden's EPA is expected to take a more holistic approach. Yes, yeah, so, okay. So they're saying the same thing. Internet upgrade. Trump rallied the world against China's 5G dominance. Okay. So then there, there's this thing about the security. Again, it, it was sort of out of nationalism, but I, I agree that China, the Chinese government is a problem. Farm aid. Uh, the problem with this is that I, I disagree with this. I think prices should go up and you basically just have to pay for for the food. Um, so I, I disagree with this. I disagree with this. I don't, I don't, I don't like. Bill, how about now derailing chat without specifying J&J, Moderna, Pfizer, etc. first? Athena Thanel, honestly, I try to depoliticize medicine that way, but it's another battle mm. I'm inevitable losing. Yeah, yeah, but they're just anti any vaccine, right? Because they're all bad, apparently. Like, I had not Um, yep, I don't support that. I don't support that. Um, banking, Trump rolled back rules on banks designed to prevent another financial crisis. Well, no, well, Trump, he, he is a bit of a puppet, but Trump was like, like, 
<laughs> the super puppet. Um, except he's a puppet for like partly for himself, but he's still he certainly he's a puppet for the billionaire class, and so he's representing himself. Um, so he's also the puppeteer in a way, but in, he's a sort of dumb puppeteer. And in any case, he's he's an idiot. Puppets and cued. In any case, he's an idiot. How the fuck what? was Trump a puppet when he was a free-speaking, loud-mouthed Powell individual? <laughs> well, he's a puppet to his own idiocy. Trump at least was his own person. Yeah, he was his own person. is a puppet. But he's a puppet to his idiocy. Um, like... <laughs> Let's see, so what, what, what was this? Banking. Rollback rules on banks designed to prevent another financial crisis. So... Yeah, so again, this is another problem. Um, so apparently it's unlikely they, that Democrats will try to undo the law they, because the party centrist tried to help pass this. I, I okay. Trump galvanized. Tales from the crypt. Child sniffing puppet. Yeah, look, he's got, he had that weird child said he said racist stuff, but um, look, he's still better. He's better than Trump, okay? Trump galvanized an anti-Silicon Valley movement in the GOP. Yeah, he, yeah, he did that. That that's that's weird. No, he's not LMFAO. Why is he not? Why is he not better than Trump? I mean, come on. If you look at the actual policies, it, they're clearly better. Um, Biden is weak as fuck, and he got pushed out of Afghanistan. Yeah, but that he that's a good. That's good. <laughs> uh, like. Environmentally, he rejoined Paris Accords. He uh, st stopped Keystone. He reallowed tra trans uh, in the military. He uh, sent aid to Central America. He stopping the. He wants to stop the wall. What, what do you mean? Stopping Keystone was a bad idea. Why? Why is that a bad idea? Wait, I, I don't even know what what what's, what 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 are you criticizing about Biden? What would you do if you were president? What would you do? Okay, wait. So what was this? Joining the Paris Climate Accord is absolutely stupid. Okay, so paying countries to do what they should be doing. Yeah. Um uh look. Raise, raise back rules on racially segregated like housing. Putin. Yeah. Yeah. But Ben Carson himself did this. Um so if he's himself a black person. Body Trump out of the presidency. It only follows that US troops get bodied out of Afghanistan. Well, that's good. That's good. That fi finally having over ninety percent of the world. I, but that's good. I, I'm glad that that, that the U.S. won out of Afghanistan. Out of presidency with the pandemic. No, no, Jesus. So you're you're both yes, into those weird crop matters now that synthetic opiates are so easy to make. Jesus. Look, Trump was terrible. I mean, look at all this shit he did. Like he he did he did all sorts of terrible shit. Biden is definitely better. Um, yeah, and his stupid his stupid tariffs also. Uh, it's all terrible. Like everything he did was bad. Like it's, it's it just. Politico. I know it's political, but the point is we know he did this. No, nobody denies that he implemented tariffs. Nobody's denying that he, you know, uh, none of this stuff. Nobody Biden is an idiot, bro. No, Biden. Well. Uh, he, He's a bit of an idiot, but compared to like Trump, is a massive idiot. Um, compared to Trump, he's a genius. Um, well, not so much a genius, but a, a wise, a wise. Trump is not an idiot. Well, Tr Trump. Yeah, because you're an idiot yourself for thinking that. I'm sorry to say this, but if if you think that Trump is not an idiot, then you are an idiot. He might be kind of smart, but in some of a weird way. But certainly, his policies were terrible. His policies were terrible. Biden's policies are pretty much better in all way, um, in all ways.
<laughs> On policy, Donald Trump was by far the most effective, consequential conservative since Reagan. Yeah, and that this is... If you make assumptions that I am an idiot based upon the fact that I like Trump, I believe you are an ignorant fool. No, because, like, if no sane, no wise person likes Trump. By the liberal media who nope. Trump for four years nope, I've been looking at all the stuff that... Look, this is, this is a... Look, free market voice for Wisconsin. McIver Institute, okay? So this is not the, the liberal media. So what, what is uh, the stuff they did? Massive, yes, you have Trump derangement syndrome. massive deregulation, saving the average American household roughly $3,100 per year. The, foreign policy? The, the point is that he gave tax... He... It depends about what specifically. He, like, for instance, he was pro the, the settlements in, uh, in Palestine by Israel. I, I don't support that. Uh, I don't support the the tariffs. Foreign policy that Biden is continuing. I I don't support the tariffs. Um, I don't think Biden was. And if he's continuing it, it's just because it's hard to. Trying to do, but you are not helping. About Iran. Yeah, against uh, harshness against Iran. No, um, he, again, he 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 removed from the the deal with Iran. I don't support that. Um. I don't support his sort of demonization of China. Like, yeah, the Chinese government is bad, but the problem is that ends up demonizing like the Chinese people. So that that is wrong. Um, eliminated Obamacare's individual mandate. Yeah, took America out of the Paris Climate Accord and Iran nuclear you deal. Iran getting a nuclear weapons program. No, he look. Demonize the Chinese people. When did he do that? Okay, to be fair, he didn't like explicitly probably, but he says China and he sort of, it, it, like his rhetoric ends up you are literally calling Trump supporters demons. You are demonizing yeah. U.S. Yeah, no, but because they are, they've demonized themselves through 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 their actions. Um, so that that's you say that Trump demonized China. Yeah, but because he's he's unfairly doing it. Demonizing Americans. No, that they've demonized themselves. Um, built up the American military, recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, broken normalization. You no, can say that the wall, us. the wall, reverse the policy. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, we know he did. Like, nobody is saying that he didn't do these tax cuts. Nobody's saying that he didn't do the wall. Um, so, all but eliminated the estate tax. I hate Democrats that. Democrats push this hate America bullshit. Look, look. Uh, there, there's no talking with Trump supporters because obviously they, they're just completely Are gone. From America, sort of in part, as you can tell from my accent. But Trump supporters are completely gone. Um, they're honestly, I'm gonna put the speech out on mute because I, I, I've basically no, no interest in in having a discussion with Trump supporters. Like I, I've just shown how, how completely ridiculous, how completely ridiculous, uh, like speech supporting Trump is. How, all the terrible stuff that he's done. Um, like literally, literally, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing this. Um, like literally, if you look at just from the environmental thing, just the separation of the kids, just the, the, all the like anti gay and trans stuff that in practice he ended up doing, even though he pretended that he was like pro gay people, uh, like, you know, all, all this, all this stuff. Um, like literally, literally. Commitment to domestic energy again. So what he did is that he ended up producing more oil and gas. So they're saying this is a good thing. It's not. So they're it's saying it literally. The United States ended up producing like became the single biggest producer of oil and gas, and he also put tariffs on on solar panels. So so yeah, this is this is a. Uh, terrible um yeah and again he had he had these tariffs on all these other things he got rid of all this sort of environmental protection all both for pollution and for carbon and for like all of that um and also he yeah he appointed all these stupid people uh he appointed all sorts of horrible people um yeah he he was, he was terrible trump was the i think trump was the worst president ever I think I think it's it's pretty it's pretty clear that Trump was the worst president ever, and yeah, and if you support Trump, yeah, that makes you a bad person. Uh, I'm, 
uh this is this is pretty pretty clear there's not much more to say like it's it's obvious like literally they themselves here you got right wing i'm not looking at the leftist propaganda here i'm looking at right wing institutes where they literally admit that trump was a parable person and they just claim they call it good but they say he did all these bad things he did all these things which we call good even though they're obviously bad and so like obviously and they're just outing themselves as bad people um so no i'm not looking at any kind of uh, propaganda or anything um it's 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 he he was a terrible person. He he it was a terrible person. He had a terrible impact. He, he he did there were a few good things in the presidency, but it was mostly unintentional. Um Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I don't I don't see why you can't see that. Like <laughs> leaving office with a twenty nine percent approval rating, the worst of his tenure as president. Um and some, but still, uh, so lo loads of people seem to support him for some reason. Um, yeah, he appointed three judges to lifetime temperatures on the Supreme Court. You got to change that. Supreme Court has to be changed. You cannot have lifetime changes, you, you, lifetime appointments. There needs to be, there needs to be rotating Supreme Court. Um, there absolutely needs to be a rotating Supreme Court. That ne that needs to be changed. Um, <laughs> Like in every way, pretty much everything that he did was was wrong. Like pretty much everything, and like the few good things were sort of like incidental or like just sort of accidental or whatever. You know, there. Um, that that's it. Like literally. Um, yeah, yeah. I just I just hope they manage. Like I just hope Biden keeps sort of going against what uh, Trump did and like keep managing to 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 reverse all this. Um, yeah, yeah. <sighs> oh, yeah. Okay, so first... Regards your feelings about the wisdom of any of these orders, Trump demonstrated the fleeting nature of non-legislative policy maneuvers, and likely to disappear. Yeah, with with Biden. So this was probably, presumably, yeah. Uh, Trump successfully attacked ISIS and dismantled a deeply flawed Iranian nuclear deal. Um, well, yeah, okay, the ISIS thing. Yeah, I don't really know what to think too much about the Iran. Again, again, I don't have and all this geopolitics stuff to me is just is just nonsense. Um. I don't believe in nationalism, so for me, there there is no good domestic foreign policy. Like there shouldn't be such a thing as foreign policy. Um, yeah, he said he made individual income taxes more progressive, but at the same time, by and large, most tax cuts were for for the rich. Um, like, so basically. Yeah, he said Trump failed to build a wall on the southern border and that which he did complete was paid for by the American taxpayers. So he says that's a bad thing. For me, that's a good thing that he failed. That was an ineffective plan for lucky failed, but also set back an important immigration debate. His predecessor will find it more difficult to reach an immigration and compromise because of Trump. And for that, we're worse off. He launched a trade war that empowered China, raised taxes on Americans, and significantly damaged our manufacturing economy long before anyone heard of COVID. Yeah, I think I think that was bad. Uh, after four years, we have fewer jobs, more inequality, and more modest stock market expansion than when he entered office. Um, yeah. COVID will, heal, will kill well over half a million Americans before a fully immunized to this round of it. No American president could have, could have prevented a larger mortality event. What? A large mortality event? Okay. Yeah, but it's true. He, he, had, he had a poor response to it. Lots of, lots of people who died from his poor response. Um, yeah, and then the election fraud. The, the lie of the election fraud. Um, yep. No. Uh, it, 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 he was like, yeah, then there's even that, just the, the fact that he actually claimed that there's an election fraud and that he actually this was stolen. Okay. Okay, so. All right, let's finish the recording here.